Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and welcome to many of our guests in the Council Chamber today, and a special welcome to Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, who joined us for her first preliminary budget hearing. And we're also joined by members uh, of the committee, Councilmember Diaz and Councilmember Deutsch and Councilmember Vallone. In today's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget hearing, we will hear testimony from the Department for the Aging, also referred to as DIFTA, on its proposed $385.2 million budget for fiscal 2021. We will also examine DIFTA's operation and related performance indicators in the 2020 preliminary mayor's management report. As DIFTA's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget does not include any funding for new needs, today's hearing provides this committee its best opportunity to explore DIFTA's baseline budget and range of programs. We will also examine whether DIFTA's budget is sufficient for meeting the needs of the fastest growing population cohort in New York City, our seniors. The administration's preliminary budget falls $10 million short of its promise to seniors. As the department know, in fiscal 2018, as part of the year of the senior, we agreed to add a total of $20 million by fiscal 2021 to improve senior center programming and staffing. Yet, here we are, examining the administration's plan for fiscal 2021, and the $10 million isn't there. I hope to hear the department's commitment today to fulfill its promise to seniors at the remaining $10 million in the executive budget, no later. The average senior center participant is a woman who lives alone and has an annual income under $20,000. But there are many more who rely on DIFTA's critical services to stay healthy, house, engage, and employ. I would highlight three key areas of concern with the ability of DIFTA's baseline budget to meet the growing needs of the city's senior population. First is Senior Centers and Meals Program. The budget doesn't include an expansion plan for senior centers, which the department's own data review are already highly utilized and often overutilized. Additionally, the recent release RFP for the home delivered meals contain many red flags. This is underlined by the Human Service Council's alarming high risk rating for the RFP driven by its insufficient total contract funding. How did the department determine the funding rate per meal in its RFP? Why is there no additional funding for culturally responsive kosher or halal meals? And how does DIFTA make requests to OMB when programs like home deliver meals or senior centers need more resources? keeping vulnerable, largely homebound seniors fed and look after couldn't be a more critical issue. Second, I want to ensure we are dealing with DIFTA's persistent case management and home care wait lists. The council and administration have partnered in the past to add substantial new baseline funding in addition to discretionary funding and new state ISEP funding of $4 million. Yet new data show the case managed waiting list is over 1,200 people and the home care waiting lists are at nearly 500. Case management is DIFTA's front door for critical services. How does DIFTA assess and serve those knocking on that front door and how much funding is needed to clear the wait list and keep it clear through an automatic funding escalator aligned to growing need. We see a cost escalator with other programs in the city, such as the Social Service Coordination Program, 
in Sarah Finance Senior Housing. Finally, we can talk about seniors without addressing the mushrooming social adult daycare industry and the Medicaid managed care long-term care cuts threatened by the state executive budget. If this new social adult daycare ombudsperson's office has new powers to find bad programs, how will it use those powers? to protect our seniors, and can we count on DIFTA to initiate investigation of fraud while also fighting cuts to long-term care? There are many other issues that I look forward to discussing today and many questions to be answered. Seniors are part of our future, and we must treat them as the asset we are. If DIFTA were funded for each senior in the way the Department of Youth and Development is for each person under the age of 25, DIFTA's budget will be approximately $660 million, or nearly $230 million more than it currently is. We have two more years together to build on our previous achievement and deliver and develop a senior service network that is the crown jewel of the country. I look forward to working together to take that step with you and your team, Commissioner. Um, I'd like to thank the committee staff for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Our senior financial anal analyst, Daniel Koop, uh, the unit head, Dohini Sapora, committee counsel, Nusa Todori, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, and my deputy chief of staff, and Director of Legislation and Budget, Marin Guerra. So now we will uh, swear the commissioner in before the testimony. Can you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to answer honestly to committee members' question? Thank you. So now we um, invite the commissioner Okay. To start your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, this, I've, this is my second preliminary budget hearing. My first was, uh, no, this, the other one was executive. Sorry. Thank you. You're right. My first was executive, which was like three days on the job. Um, good morning, Chair Chin and the members of the Aging and Finance Committee. As you know, I'm Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, Commissioner for the Department for the Aging, and I am joined this morning by Jose Melgado, who is the Chief Financial Officer at the Department for the Aging. And I thank you for this opportunity to discuss uh, DIFTA's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2021. I also will hope that this testimony addresses some of your uh, issues and concerns. In addition to working to eliminate ageism, which is our biggest uh, battle that we have to confront, ensuring the dignity and quality of life and the life of the older workers, providing high quality service and, and resources is among the department's top priority. To support this important work, our FY21 preliminary budget projects uh, 2.385.2 uh, 300, uh, million in funding which includes allocations of 173 million to support older adult centers, 41.8 million for home delivered meals, 38 million for case management, 35 million to support home care for homebound elders who are not Medicaid eligible, 8 million for NORC programs and 8 million for caregiver services. In addition to supporting these services, the commitment of this administration has also expanded critical geriatric mental health initiatives, needed elder abuse supports, and other essential programs, including caregiver services, which we discussed at length during our last hearing. Through the support and advocacy of important stakeholders, uh, stakeholders many of who are in this audience this morning, we have also advanced uh, many of our efforts to help older New Yorkers age in place and age with dignity. Some notable joint successes include ensuring parity 
among programming in our congregate center. Congregate food costs and center staff structure and salaries. Record growth in our home delivered meals program, which on average delivers more than 18,000 meals per day to homebound older adults across the city. The expansion of our network of social clubs in NYCHA developments, which as of November 2019 increased by 12. And the promulgation of the rules which empower our social adult daycare ombudsman office to have greater oversight on possible fraudulent or unscrupulous actions of SAD's operations in New York City. We are also incredibly grateful for the ongoing support of the City Council, which in FY20 awarded uh, the Department for the Aging with over $46 million in discretionary fund, effectively allowing us even greater investments to, uh, to offer services to underserved and unserved communities. One such investment includes the $1.3 million for nursing services in our NORCs, our naturally occurring retirement communities. While reorganizing all of the, while re recognizing all of the important external partnerships, I would be remiss not to mention that the de Blasio administration has over the past six years consistently made major investments in aging services, including an overall increase of $118 million in base funding. This fiscal year, the long, deliberate model uh, budget exercise came to a successful close. The overarching goal of this es uh, exercise is twofold. First, to increase resources and ensure stro uh, strong programming and adequate food costs across our network of congregate centers. And secondly, to make more uniform the funding level of each center, at least to adequate levels, and to support equity in staffing uh, structures and salary. In FY18, the first phase of this process focused on programming and program staff and resulted in a significant investment of 10 million of baseline funding in our network of older adults. These centers were thus able to use this increased funding to right-size salaries, hire more staff, and expand the, um, and enrich center programming, as well as to address historical inequities. The second and final phase of the module, model budget process focused on expenses related to food costs and food-related staff. In FY20, this process resulted in an additional 10 million baseline funding for congregate food costs and for staff salary parity. In addition to these major investments of tens of millions of dollars in annual funding to our older adult congregate centers, the administration has also made a commitment to increase this funding as we move forward. Home delivered meals is of, of great importance. In addition, um, of great importance and a vital component of DIFTA's network of services. Not only do the home delivered meals provide sustenance to older uh, homebound adults, but also uh, it may be the only interaction, human interaction, that the older person may have for the day. Support of our own ongoing effort to combat social isolation, which as we know is at epidemic proportions in this city. On any given weekday throughout the city, approximately 18,000 homebound older people receive a home delivered meal. In 2019, a record total of 4.5 million and above were delivered by our providers, demonstrating just how essential this program truly is. Just a few weeks ago, on January 22nd to be exact, we issued a request for proposal, commonly known as an RFP, for our home delivered meals program. Through this RFP, which was preceded by a spirit, spirited and meaningful public concept paper process that engaged many conversation and many stakeholder meetings. DIFTA is seeking to fund programs that are able to address the most critical 
overarching goals of the Home Delivered Meals Program, including increasing meal options for recipients, embracing the diversity of our city by increasing the availability of culturally aligned meals, and promoting uniformly high quality meals made from nutritious ingredients. In addition to choice, diversity, and quality, great emphasis is also placed on ensuring that food, is pur food purchase meets the good food purchasing guidelines set forth by the Mayor's Office of Food Policy and fosters greater collaboration among and within the network. Since its issuance, the RFP has generated great interest, enthusiasm, and, crit uh, and inquiries among potential proposers. Excuse me for a minute. DIFTER has since hosted a well-attended bidders conference with over 60 individuals in attendance representing 48 organizations. We fielded various questions from interested parties and and accordingly released a series of addenda, a total of four to date. We have also extended the submission deadline in response to one of those inquiries. Responses to the RFP are now officially due on Wednesday, April 8, 2020. Again, in this fiscal year, in December 2019, Mayor Bill de Blasio, along with Speaker Johnson, announced the launch of a Break, groundbreaking indirect cost uh, rate, indirect cost rate funding uh, designed to increase the financial stability for human services providers, primarily and predominantly in the nonprofit organizations. This is a game changer, particularly for diff to smaller contractors, as it also addresses historical inequities among those smaller contractors. Nonprofits may now receive additional funding for their organization's indirect costs, such as audits, accounting staff, fundraising staff, that in previous years was not offered or not available. Honored in the November plan update, this commitment is $54 million of an annual investment and applicable to health and human service contracts across all city agencies. Thus far, only 10% of our network of contractors have already submitted the entryway choice form, the first step in the ICR process. Please join me in encouraging our entire network of service providers to take this necessary first step and ensuring that their critical service needs may continue into the future by signing up for the ICR. The items I described are only a few among our recent accomplishments. The administration has able to support and uh, achieve this fiscal year, of which I am proud is one of the first few months of as my role as commissioner. Others include the RFP for our ger uh, generic uh, geriatric mental health programs, which will expand our mental health services and intervention in congregate centers the relaunch of the elder abuse campaign intended to raise public awareness on the nuances and types of abuses, which range from physical violence to mental, emotional, and financial abuse, the development of our social adult daycare registration payment portal, which launched earlier this week. We now have 18 registrants to date. And in collaboration with 311, we created an open Aging Connect, our in-house information and referral contact center, to help older New Yorkers and their families navigate the complex network of aging services, programs, and supports throughout the city. city. Needless to say, much of this has been achieved this year for the city's older adult population and for our network of providers who serve them. Simultaneously, during my 10-month tenure as commissioner, DIFTA has also successfully completed a bold and robust reorganization and restructuring process, all in an effort to ensure our greater efficiency and, effect and effectiveness to advance the department's mission. As you know, keeping pace with the ev evolving needs of the city's 1.7 million adults cannot be accomplished alone or in a vacuum. Thus, 
we will continue to rely on our own ongoing partnership with the Council and the effective advocacy of our stakeholders and all of our contracted providers. And lastly, and arguably most importantly, the older adults themselves, for whom all of our hard work and efforts are ultimately intended to benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Ayala and uh, Councilmember Rosenthal. I'm gonna start with uh, a couple of questions and then I am going to pass it on to my colleagues. <coughs> Commissioner, I wanted to start with looking at long-term strategy and outlook. Looking at overall, uh, at DIFTA's $385 million budget in fiscal um, 2021 preliminary budget, what do you see as the two or three key budget priorities at DIFTA over the next two years um, of this administration? I think our core services are a budget priority. Um, and those are home delivered meals and congregate meals. In addition to that, we cannot lose sight of, uh, so meals would be one, and we cannot lose sight of the many new, older New Yorkers who are homebound. So case management, home care services for those who are not Medicaid eligible, again, are high priorities. But in addition to those high priorities, I think that there's a basic issue that we as a community, as a city, and as a nation need to confront, and that is the issue of ageism, because that is what holds all of this marginalization in place. And until we crack that, we still have workforce issues, resource issues, and all of that. So I think that is a basic thing as we move forward that we have to confront. And of course, additional uh, services to our, in our congregate setting is geriatric mental health and, and really combating social isolation. Social Great. isolation, sorry. You know, we are expecting nearly 1.9 million seniors in the New York City um, in the next two decades, 20%. One in five residents are gonna be older adults if they are blessed to get there. So which program um, will DIFTA prioritize to expand or create in order to support this growing senior population? Mm. And how much more funding is needed? I have to look at that with the future view. When I think of that population growth, I think of a city and an older population that is very diverse than the population we know it to be today not only ethnically, culturally, and religiously diverse, but also diverse in terms of the age spectrum. So when I look at that population, I start thinking, we have a model of service today that is based on a 1970 perspective of aging population, not a future perspective. So when I look at that, it's to look at what will congregate settings and educational and recreational facilities be how different will they have to be in the future and as we move forward than they are today. I also have to think of how culturally diverse our meal programs have to be our, uh, and how religiously diverse our meal programs have to be. So when I look at the entire spectrum of services, I look at that. The other thing that we look at is homebound. M people are gonna be living longer uh, and many more older people may be homebound. What's the implication for in-home services and the shortage of home care providers uh, and home care, home care workers? And that's where I, when I start looking at my longer view, those are the areas that I look at. But I keep saying that the thing that we have to combat is ageism so that we are not looking at this as a separate population, but an age-inclusive popular a city and nation that's age inclusive and that looks at older uh, individuals as assets mm -hmm. to every society and we not we must must tackle this epidemic called social isolation I mean thank you we uh, you know we have hearings and legislation and dealing with age discrimination and there are 
older adults that are still in the workforce and there are older adults that are still very active in a lot of our programs, senior centers. They count on the volunteers uh, that are the, the seniors themselves. Now the overall picture uh, from the local law 140 um, 2019 data is of highly utilized senior center with over three quarter of them at 100% or greater uh, utilization. Does DIFTA have a plan to increase the number of senior centers? And how does the capital budget support the goals of acquiring and renovating senior centers? So I'm gonna answer the vision question and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Jose Mercado, our chief financial officer, who's been looking at some of the capital needs. As we plan and look at it, uh, look at the growth opportunities, we do that with the city, city administration, the Office of Management and Budget, as we start planning out what the future needs are. So those are constant conversations that we look at. We do recognize that they may be additional uh, senior centers, oh, I hate calling them senior centers, older adult centers, that we know that they are additional needs for that. And we were projecting that they're probably gonna be 17 to 18 in the new, near future. But that is a conversation that we, that is all part of our regular planning process with the city. Yeah, because already you know that we, in partner with DIFTA, um, the, the council has funded 10 discretionary, with discretionary funding, 10 center that serve senior population. Uh, right. And that was also came from recommendation from DIFTA when they visited some of the site that were not funded right. um, by right. DIFTA. And so I think we see already there is a great need for more of these centers. And at the same time, there are more social adult daycare center, the private ones, than the yeah, one that is and, and publicly funded. So there is. That, that is a conversation where you have piqued my interest. I think we had this conversation not too long ago when we were looking at vision and future. And I think that we need to start exploring different ways of adding components to congregate centers that may incorporate some of those special needs as social adult day care centers have. And I think that we're very open to explore that with you and have further discussions on that. And I wanna tackle another issue because we, we talk about needs, but we also need to talk about underutilization. That is one of the things that we're trying to also tackle at the Department for the Aging. Because when, when a program is underutilized, that means the resources are not going to a program who needs it and are overutilized. So we're looking at systems and how we can make pivot and make some adjustments mid-year. Uh, to address some of those issues. And that probably is a good segue into um, the capital budget because some of the centers that maybe who are underutilized are not that nice, <laughs> that needs a lot of repair. I mean, I think in past hearing we have seen centers with ceilings falling down and uh, so and that's one thing that we wanted to really look at. How do we utilize like new senior building that's being built or new community center in the mayor uh, state of the city that he talked about. We wanna make sure that the older population are not left out. And that new facility when they are being built, those are the opportunity that we can create uh, these senior older adult centers in much better environment. We have an ongoing relationship with HPD again as our part of our planning process. Excuse me, and our forward, I'm just fighting a little bit of a sore throat here. Um, as, we, as we look at the population and new developments, we're constantly looking how is it that we can support those developments with older adult centers and services. So that is an ongoing part of our regular uh, planning process with HPD, our sister agency. You want to address capital, Jose? Yeah. Good morning. Um, as the commissioner mentioned in her testimony, we were, you know, she just did a, a, a reorganization of the, the team, and we were actually we were actually reorganizing our expense budget. And then, as pointed out earlier, you know, we are going to start looking at our capital budget and turning how to leverage that capital budget because there is a lot of capital projects that we should be focusing on. So you'll see from us a, a, in the future a plan of how to leverage it. 
What, what is Stifta's capital budget now? One second. <laughs> 12 million. Roughly about $17.3 million for this year. In the five-year capital plan, it's about $54.9 million. The majority of our funding does come from the city council. <laughs> because all of the council members yes. put in money. Yes, so our five-year capital plan, for example, 30.6 out of the 50 point, out of the 54.9 is city council money. So Th that, we that, appreciate all the money you give us. I, I'm glad that the council is contributing, but we want the, the administration to either up it and match it, and so it should not be just the, the council supporting it. That should be part of the administration's plan um, for the uh, increasing older adult population. So I'm going to do one more question, and then I'll um, pass it over to my colleague. The model budget so, uh, shortfall. Um, the senior center model budget was baseline at 10 million for phase one um, in 2018, year of the senior, and that was focusing on programming and staff. And the administration at that time promised that by 2021, funding for the first phase will rise to a total baseline of investment of 20 million and it wasn't included in the preliminary budget. I just assumed that it was gonna be in there and I was focusing my energy on fighting for other resources. And then the staff told us, it's not in there. So I view this as a budget shortfall um, against a previous commitment. Why was the funding excluded in the preliminary plan? And will you confirm that we will see the 10 million reflected in the executive budget? And also, will the 38 excluded senior center satellites and clubs be included in the final tranche of the 10 million? And if not, how is DIFTA assessing needs uh, of those centers? The, um, we have been assured that the 10 million will be in the executive budget. And uh, we will continue to work on developing this plan and reviewing those the, those, the di distribution and allocation of those $10 million. Now the 38 center that was not included in the 249, are they gonna be taken care of in the second part? It will be part of the evaluation and review process to make sure that they meet the criteria um, that we have set forth and we will move forward from that. There were some programs that uh, their resources were such that they did not qualify. Means that they had enough resources? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we will follow up with you in, in terms yes. to make sure every program um, is taken care of. All right, I'm gonna start with uh, Councilman Malone with your question. Thank you to our mighty Chair Chin, who has been leading us to now in our seventh budget battle and all the advocates that come and stand, we can give Margaret our hand wave because she's been fighting for us for her entire career. Um, and Commissioner, good morning. Good morning. Remember, on budget days, we're fighting to get you money. So when we're angry or we're upset, you do miracles with the budget that you have. But in the world of seniors, we will always say you do not have enough. So I always start with, with the population that we have in New York City that grows. Without a budget to properly reflect that growth, then it's in fact a cut because to try to deal with the same numbers year after year, even with minimal amount of increases, is not enough. And for today, for those who everyone in this room will passionately deal with senior services, there isn't an area that you covered today or that Margaret covered that doesn't need more money, whether it's senior centers, transportation, meals, worker reimbursement, care programs, growth of culturally sensitive issues. There isn't anything on the list, so it's impossible in a couple of minutes to say, why not this? And I think at the last hearing, I think we were a bit mesmerized when Margaret and I spoke about capital repairs, non-expense repairs, and that DIFTA is charted to do that. Has there been any focus or change or growth in the staffing on your end to deal with capital repairs at senior centers and NYCHA centers? Has there been an additional funding to also deal with that? Because I don't see anything really in that. Here. There was uh, $4 million given to us 
baseline so that we could do some repairs in senior centers and it was focused around making sure that um, air conditioning units and some minor repairs and gas and uh, some other kitchen related uh, needs were addressed. And to date, we have, uh, Jose, you wanted to address that? Yeah. Uh, as of to date, uh, we've already spent close to $700,000. We have, we're working with New York City Housing Authority on about $2 million more on planned pl um, repairs and, and maintenance programs as well. So on the repairs that you've done and the repairs that need to be done, how many on the list are still need to be attended to and how much is the amount of money that's on the list that needs to be repaired? We have 242 sites that have been completed in their air conditioning and their work is, is fine. And what we're working on is 85 uh, sites that are either in the planning design or a different level of a repair in this whole contracting process. So is it centered solely on air conditioning? I didn't hear, I'm sorry. Are the repairs centered solely on air conditioning? No, not all of them, not all of them, but that's the primary bulk of it. So where are we on the repair list? How many of those are NYCHA centers versus non-NYCHA centers? How many is it, is it capital? And I know you also have non-capital non expense reimbursement also. Not all of these are NYCHA. They're NYCHA. Yeah, these are all NYCHA. The funding, yep. yeah. Go ahead. The funding that we receive is for NYCHA related. So what about the non-NYCHA senior centers that we are city that. contract? We, we handle that with our other facility maintenance uh, budget and that is on the expense side. Do we have an update on where we are on those? I can get back to you on that. Okay, because that is something that also, um, and how do we determine emergency repairs versus daily repairs? Is that something that we break down a list also on them? Yes. Okay. Within the senior center itself, you have an RFP that's coming up, a concept paper and an RFP for senior centers. Can you elaborate a little more on what's coming? Uh, we will issue in our uh, concept paper within the next few months. What we are doing at this time, as we did with the home delivered meal RFP, is we're starting to formulate work groups so that we can look at the range of issues that we want to address in the concept paper. Um, some of the things that we're looking at is locations. The other thing that we're looking at is the diversity of services, meaning a, a variety of services that can deal with the various uh, age groups. We're looking at more collaboration and working groups among uh, senior providers. We're also looking at this notion, which I believe uh, we'll see if, it verif it's, if it's confirmed in our discussions with the network at large and some other stakeholders, is to look at that all senior centers, some might just be primed and positioned to be meal service sites, and others may be a fuller educational recreational site. And so we're looking at different models in this continuum of service that we know will be changing for older adults. So there's a variety of- So there's a lot in there, but you don't really need, I mean, this, we can kind of tell you with the focus groups, what those senior center needs are. So I, I hope we can bypass that pretty quickly. But you mentioned locations. What do you mean by locations? It's a, it can t it ex open new locations or to keep the existing locations? We're looking at new locations. We're looking at different type, you know, we could look at different type of providers, you know, um, and we're just looking at just keeping ourselves open, given the fact that this aging population is changing than, than the aging population that we have programmed for in the past, as I said earlier, than the aging population that we know will come in the future. It's gonna be a lot more diverse, the age span is gonna be greater, the needs are going to be greater. And where they- Language locate. services, that's a big thing in our district, having an additional ability to have those services in multiple languages at the centers, having different healthcare providers and legal services and social workers, the list keeps going on. The list keeps going on. And, and also with the staff funding, anything with COLA increases of cost of living because retention of staff is always one of the most difficult. You have these wonderful workers working day and night. Uh, and we can't keep up with market rate and we lose them. So are we yeah, gonna thank try? You for, thank you for raising that because it's been one of the concerns and one of the issues that we're looking at uh, in totality. 
we, we have noticed and we've seen a pattern and, and thanks to the city council, we've been able to address some of the economic inequities and in salaries in terms of food service staff and at some, some level in the senior center staff. What we have noticed is that as a whole, the aging network, salaries are usually um, lower than caseworkers and social workers who are working in other sectors. So we're looking at this entire uh, area called salaries for the aging network professional. How do we professionalize that more? How do we upgrade that? And so those are all the kind of things that we're looking at so that we can have parity so that if you're a social worker in a hospital or you're in social work in another sector in the human service area, that there is some comparability in terms of market, market cost. That would be tremendous if we were able to do that. My last question on the senior centers would be the council and Margaret and we always step up to put funding in for services at the senior centers and Thank that you. creates such a difficult contractual process year after year after year for the providers. Any thought of that being baseline so we can avoid that? We, that's a conversation that we have on an ongoing basis is to get <laughs> we do. What, gets, what gets baseline. And I think that we're all working towards the same goal. The goal is to ensure that we can have as many uh, resources and services for this population. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Eugene. Council Member Deutsch, your question. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, so RFP divides, RFPs divide, um, divides New York City into geographic uh, regions and each contract is responsible. What I understand is that each contract is responsible for providing all categories of meals that are served. Um, so an organization that applies for an RFP, which includes a specific cultural meals, are they permitted to apply uh, for the RFP, like for example, if there's a specific organization that only serves halal or only serves kosher, are they permitted to apply? A organization that provides halal, if they have the capacity to, it, to uh, serve the entire catchment area, of course they can, uh, uh, they can apply. If that, and they can, if, if there's other than, uh, other needs in that population uh, than halal meals, then they can partner with someone else who can provide the balance of those meals. So it is not the total expectation that one contractor in a full uh, catchment area can provide all of the needs, which is one of the things that this RFP did was to really build in the opportunity for greater collaboration across providers. So can one uh, contract apply for an RFP specifically only serving um, halal or only serving kosher or only serving any one specific cultural group? If the catchment area has needs beyond those, uh, they would need to collaborate and partner with someone who could address the other needs in that particular community. So my question is, so what would that, um, what, from what I understand is, is that serving as a, a subcontractor, right, so that um, org would still have to do some of the work, correct? And in order to, um, for them, to actually pay their workers and to go out and, and serve as a subcontractor, they would actually have to go out out of the box and raise funds in order to, um, you know, to, to, to compensate for the difference um, by serving as a subcontractor. Does that make sense? I'm gonna to try to answer what I believe the question is, which is, total cost for the subcontractor. Correct. And the total cost for the subcontractor is part of the negotiation process between the subcontract, the primary contractor and the subcontractor. So what happens, so who has oversight of that uh, conversation between the contractor and subcontractor? And what happens if the needs are not met uh, from the contractor to the subcontractor that it cannot get done? Uh, 
the aging staff, the Department for the Aging Staff is always available to help uh, during that process, but I think that that is at a local level, the relationship between two providers and they negotiate. They have some basic information. They have the number of the population in the area, they have the food cost, and they also have a basic understanding of what some of those other related costs are. So is it possible, is it possible that a subcontractor and working with the contractor, um, there is a gap of uh, services because they have an issue with the agreements or that they're making between each other to serve a certain population within that area, is it possible? I would hope that they would not negotiate a contract or an agreement that would have a gap in services. The intention is to make sure that services are covered. So um, do you think, do you believe that um, a subcontract would have to raise outside funding in order to serve a specific population? That's your question, Are and I'm gonna answer this, um, all of our programs, all human service ser uh, opportunities and uh, uh, services can never be paid 100% by government dollars, which is one of the things that it's important to have outside support and donors and private sector investment. One of the things that we have also built into all of our contracts is contributions to help offset and defray some of those costs. So it is never the expectation that government would pay 100% of the service. Um, can you give me like one example or two examples of where a non-for-profit serving our seniors will ha would have to raise um, money, outside money? There's, there's a myriad of them. There's Carter Burden, there, there's, there's the Union Settlement, there is a, a whole host of non-profits who have strong partnerships with the philanthropic and private sector communities to uh, augment their services. So do you think that when it comes to basic needs for seniors, such as food, that a, um, a contractor or a, actually a subcontractor should have to raise money uh, from an outside source when it comes to basic, basic needs for a senior to put, to have food, to have food in? I want to distinguish the conversation between a negotiation between two contractors who are gonna have a subcontract arrangement with each other and the provision of basic needs. The Department for the Aging provides the, the food costs and the basic needs to meet the demands of a particular catchment area. Uh, and the, 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 it really is a discussion among, and a negotiation among those two contractors. So um, I'm getting, I'm receiving calls from from my constituents and from people that serve, um, and and they're having issues with uh, serving the specific populations because of the cultural needs. So how can we rectify that? Councilmember uh, Deutsch, uh, my suggestion is that um, you could take it offline and really um, talk to DIFTA in terms of sure, you know, getting more than happy. support I would, to be able I to answer actually, the questions of your constituent organization that are thinking about applying for the RFP. Okay, I would love to, and uh, this also would have to do f um, when at a budget hearing today, so that would also have to do with the budget, that if we could uh, do something and work something out, so these um, subcontractors are able to apply for an RFP to serve these groups, so that would be uh, instrumental to have this discussion during the budget hearing like today. So I'd like to have an offline uh, a meeting with you. If your office could reach out uh, to my office, we if we could set up a one-on-one, -on -one, and if you could come visit my southern, um, my southern district in Brooklyn, where I could show you firsthand the work that, uh, that, the work that they do and the needs that uh, my seniors uh, have. I'll be happy to visit again. I've been to that area, and I'm, I'm very, very pleased to have this discussion with you um, offline also. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I, okay, next will be uh, Council Member Rosenthal followed by Council Member Ayala. And I would 
like to ask my colleague uh, to keep their question as brief as possible because we have a lot of people signed up to testify and we still have a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I do uh, just want to take issue with one thing that, uh, Commissioner, it's always great to see you, sorry. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I would take issue with the idea that government should expect the private um, charity to take care of those who are most vulnerable. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if that's what came across. That that's was what not, I heard. All right. And, and if that's I think it, government's I, responsibility is, is to be the safety net. And so when we're talking about populations that, um, you know, New York City, my goodness, 157, 200 different languages, so many different cultures, it is incumbent upon us to understand the safety net services of um, needs of our diverse communities. And yes, that might cost more money. Um, yes, city so we I will. We, we all choose to live in and to, to right. serve. Yes, so the needs of the most vulnerable are, I, I do say that, but what I, what I was trying to say, and I may not have said it artfully, is that in the nonprofit sector, you know, there is a relationship in terms of both the government dollars as well as uh, the philanthropic community, and that um, yeah, that's Let's, important. All right, you and I can agree to disagree <laughs> um, because uh, but I the most basic needs are our responsibility. You're well, absolutely yeah, right. and I mean I think over the last six years, this city council, uh, along with the mayor, has fought very hard to yes. increase funding to the nonprofit sector, absolutely. where the previous mayors fully believed that the um, that philanthropy should play such a big role, and therefore they cut funding in a meaningful way to all of our social service programs. And you know, maybe one of our former mayors could personally make up the difference in that cost. <laughs> You're but absolutely this right. This mayor, nor any mayor that follows, unless he comes back, will likely be able to do that, and it's to the disservice, I think, of all New Yorkers. This and mayor. We don't want to get in the habit of, of expecting no. philanthropy to make up the shortfall. You're absolutely right, and I stand uh, corrected because this mayor has made an investment of, of $118 million no to restore the devastation that this department suffered. No in the question. Past. No question. So I'm but sorry that I misled It's that, okay. okay, sorry. My ears are attuned to no, it. No, I, I, so am I. <laughs> what you. I was going to ask you was actually, um, you know, how, how we can rectify the situation that seniors are still sort of, you know, uh, the ping pong ball and a bit part of the budget, budget dance for New York City. And we've unfortunately fallen into that same situation again. I mean, you know, the first phase of senior center model budgeting was promised for fiscal year 2021, uh, $10 million, and wasn't included in the mayor's executive budget. I mean, that's, w what's the signal he's sending there? I think I want to just clarify for the record that the administration is committed to have the funding for the senior center model uh, budget phase two in the budget by the start of FY21. At the start of, so the mayor, dis, so the mayor it feels might be that strongly, sector. but didn't put it in in February and plans to put it in in May. And, and is there, uh, let's put a pin in it and talk about it offline because this isn't necessarily part of the public discourse, but I, I do find that disturbing because if that is his intention, we all know that the budget dance that goes on beyond the scenes is the council fighting for things. And are you then saying that the city council would not have to use its fight for additional funds to include that 10 million because we can assume the mayor will put that in regardless of whether or not the city council includes that as a request as part of our budget response. Yeah, the administration is committed to having funding for this phase okay. two All in right. the beginning Thank of FY21.
Um, I'm wondering about the indirect rates on the nonprofit for the nonprofits um, that provide these services. So again, just making sure that these nonprofits are not set up to fail as they had been under previous mayors. Um, so there was an agreement to add um, tens of millions of dollars for indirect rates to be um, to be baselined. And um, DIFTA has about 370 contracts that are eligible for this. How many have um, been settled where they've been given that indirect rate by now? We've only had 10% of that contracts actually come in through the process. Apply. Applied. And Which is one of the appeals that I'm making is to make sure that many more of our contractors avail themselves of this. We were assured back in, um, I don't want to exaggerate, so I'm going to say September or November, even though this was put in the budget in July, um, in November that a letter had gone out from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services um, saying please apply. So everyone knows to apply. Absolutely. As you've called around, if only uh, it concerns me that only 10% have applied, what do you attribute that to? We have made several outreach efforts. Uh, we know that it is, uh, the implementation is being managed and centralized by the city implementation team at OMB and MOX. Uh, providers have been informed through the, about the process through the provider work group that meets regularly with uh, CIT. And, um, you know, the, some providers are trying to calculate what their indirect cost may be. And, and justifying that, and the CIT is supporting agencies and providers, you know, working with our with our with with the various ACOs to make sure that um, they're conducting regular outreach and everyone is working diligently because we know, particularly for the smaller nonprofits, that this is a life, this is essential to their um, to their growth and sustainability. I appreciate your support of it, but I'm a little bit um, asking, and maybe um, uh, maybe the committee can send this out to you to try to get this response from you. As you've spoken with, as you or your ACOs, um, Commissioner, the, the contract officers have spoken to the nonprofits that have not submitted the paperwork are they aware that they can simply ask for a basic 12%? I mean, yes. it's so simple to, I've looked at the paperwork, I, I can't understand, like if you could even give me one example of a nonprofit and why they've not submitted the paperwork, I'd be interested to know. I can, I can get back to you on that, but Jose, you have Yeah, I just wanted to just sort of say is, for example, the 12% um, has already expired as of January 31st. So throughout this whole process, there have been, the, I would say this, uh, this mock has actually, every month has been sending out letters. Right, but that's not my question. Well, I mean, part of it, I, I think, get it. You've tried. We've tried. So I, my I, question they is, have till the why end of aren't fiscal, they? And they have to the end of fiscal 20 to submit their, their, um, their request really? to So the everyone's city. just procrastinating? 90%? I don't, I don't think it, I would. I, I mean that in a, as, a, as a procrastinator yeah, myself. Yeah, no, I, 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 Tell I, I the Rosendahl. Uh, okay, we'll take that off. Stop procrastinating, we gotta move. <laughs> we gotta move, gotta move. Um, so I'll end it there. I, I'm very concerned that 90% have not applied. Um, that is disconcerting. Thank you so much, thank you, Chair. Yeah, we can follow up with the provider when they testify later also on that. Um, Councilmember Ayala, followed by Councilmember Diaz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, in, fiscal, in fiscal year 2020, the city allocated $40 million to perform outreach ahead of this year's census to improve New York City's response rate in historically undercounted communities. As part of the city's plan to ensure a complete count, city agencies were asked to partner in get out the count uh, drives by either forming a plan of their own or by incorporating census outreach into their existing programs and or services. Has ZIFTA created a get out the plan, um, plan, get out the count plan in collaboration with New York City Census 2020 and um, 
do all senior centers have census material? We've worked very diligently since the beginning. The, you know, with the 2020 census is important to all of us and to the city, as you uh, aptly said, uh, council member. And so what we have done is work with the 2020 field team and made, inf we've had information sessions. We had volunteer, volunteer recruitment uh, for that. We have also sent around information um, to all of our congregate centers with information on how to schedule these sessions uh, on the census. In addition to that, there's been collateral materials distributed to all of our congregate sites. The census messaging is included in all of our external newsletters, as well as uh, well uh, promulgated through our social media. And we've been working with the New York 2020 Census and the U.S. Census to recruit older adults to be uh, uh, workers for the census, which is another way of having a trusted partner. We know that there has been a dedicated uh, effort to have a widespread of uh, nonprofits reflecting all sectors of our community as part of the census. And we've worked with 2020 census that we have some dedicated computers at each of, at some of, at most of our senior center sites to make sure that we have full participation. What about language capacity? I'm a little bit concerned specifically uh, for senior centers that have seen um, an increase in immigrant populations. I always speak about uh, East Harlem, for instance, where we have a, a growing um, Asian population, specifically Chinese, non-English speaking. Um, we've been very fortunate in that through initiatives funded through the council, we've been able to supplement the, um, the, the cost of hiring uh, bilingual social workers at two of our sites, um, but that may not be the case in all senior centers, and so older adult centers, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, so is that's, that's obviously, is that something that DIFTA is, is concerned about as well? The materials have been uh, translated into multiple languages and have been distributed as such. But, is, but if staff is not appropriate, I mean, how are we ensuring? If, if there's a specific, area, we only have a few days, but if there's yeah. a specific issue and need, please let us know and we will address that immediately. Yeah. Regarding the, uh, the mental health um, funding for Thrive for the uh, DIFTA Geriatric Mental Health Program, um, there was a $3.1 million baseline budget that was intended to expand be, uh, beyond the 25 existing senior centers to potentially 25 more with additional funding, um, FY20 funding, which was I think 1.7 million. Um, what is the current number of senior centers offered uh, geriatric mental health programming service? With the additional funds, we were able to expand the number from 25 to 38. And we are also have several more, you know, there's an approval process to get it approved as a designated site. So there are several more in the final approval process stage. And can you share what the range of services that are being offered at those centers um, is and does it differ by contracted provider? The range of services are one, identification, um, engaged in activities to make them comfortable raising the issues around mental health uh, to clinicians so that we have a bunch of sessions designed around that. They are, so far we have been, they've been very successful in having been screened for mental health services. Two thirds of those who have been screened have been found to be in need of clinical uh, intervention and so we, this also suggests that there is a high level of need. And about of those in need, 81% have received treatment from a clinician as a result of these services. And I can't impress upon you enough that prior to the Thrive gener uh, Geriatric Mental Health, these services were not as vastly available in congregate setting. And these numbers indicate the importance and the value that this brings. I agree, and I would add that, you know, we should also be pushing for therapeutic programming at these sites because um, it's, it's always great to have a mental health provider on site to speak to, but I find that when I worked in senior center settings that, um, you know, even in coordinated activities, we had, I think it was a jewelry making uh, 
project and we found that it was very therapeutic for the, pe the participants of that program to just have the ability to kind of come together um, and, and share their experiences and, and many of these individuals were going through really traumatic experiences, whether they were losing loved ones or they were very ill and found the, uh, the experience to be um, really therapeutic and I think that that should also be a part of you know, of the conversation. So I look forward to um, seeing the expansion of this program um, is one that I... And one of, one of the other ways that we're looking to expand this program as we move forward is the hub and spoke model, which is because a site has to be approved to be a mental health site, what we want to do is to have one of those approved sites then have satellites where they can bring clients from those smaller congregate settings that might not be deemed approved or might not be approved so that they can bring those into their approved site so that services can still be available to smaller congregate centers. Um, and so that hub and spoke will also expand the capacity. How lengthy is the approval process? Uh, it, it, varies. it varies. It varies on the site. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. We've been joined by uh, Councilmember Traeger, so we're going to have questions from Councilmember Diaz and then Councilmember Traeger. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Commissioner, buenos días. Buenos días. ¿Cómo está? Muy bien, caballero. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, as, as we all know, the coronavirus mm -hmm. is very dangerous for senior citizens. And could you please tell me how much money are you asking? How much money are you putting? What are you doing to f help senior citizen centers protect themselves and protect the senior citizen population? Sure. Are I you asking any money in this budget for that? The city of New York has been extremely aggressive. I'm very proud to say that well in advance of any other locality, New York City heightened its preparedness and its need for preparedness as late as a January, as far back as j the end of January, to present not only to prepare not only because we had an incident before anything hit our borders, but because we knew. What was it that the mayor's phrase was, not if, but when. And uh, they have been regular. Yesterday, there was an entire uh, meeting with the city council around coronavirus. This is a high priority for the city and for this mayor. I don't think you are answering, I don't think you are answering me. And, and so I, I will try to answer your question. I, what we my, have done. My question was simple. How much money are you asking or are you putting in this budget exclusively to help senior citizen centers protect their population against the virus? With, oh, sir, this coronavirus approach is a public health approach and it has to be used in that manner. This is a coordinated are you asking, effort. Are you asking the city, the council member, the, the mayor, are you, are you the department asking? Uh, we need funds, we need this to protect senior citizens. I have the utmost confidence that the mayor is going to do all and has made it very clear that this is a priority and that resources will be made available to combat yeah. Uh, this this uh, disease. Mi amiga, listen carefully what I'm saying. You just said we have 220 center at over at over 100 percent full capacity. Yes. Yesterday, the administration is saying that I concerned with this. Yesterday they announced that they have 1,000 testing kits for the whole city. If we, 
use the 1,000 only for the 220 centers, it will be about five kids per center. So if we are concerned in protecting senior citizens that are in this, in this case, are very, very uh, in dangerous situation, in a very dangerous situation because uh, the, the coronavirus are proven to, to attack them faster than other population. So if we only have 1,000 kids for the whole city to test for the whole city, how are we doing for senior citizen centers? How are we doing? How, do, how are we protecting them? Sir, our Department of Health and our Commission of Health has, we have done nothing but for the last few weeks, have tabletop meetings on a daily basis with the mayor around the same issue. We have the utmost confidence that this administration and this health commissioner, who I will defer your questions to, have made all of the provisions necessary should it reach that level. We are very clear that it has not reached that level, and we do not want to cause chaos or alarm in our senior centers or in the population as a whole. Uh -huh. We have taken and given the best guidance, state-of-the-art guidance issued by the Commissioner of Health, our Public Health Commissioner, as well as the CDC on what are the steps that the public should take and also what are the guidance that we have offered for non-health-related uh, staffers who are in close contact with, with individuals. All of those guidance have been issued by the Department for the Aging as well as by the city as a whole. So I am very, very uh, confident that this city is well prepared at heightened preparedness to deal with this, with this uh, virus. Uh, Council Member Diaz, I think the, yesterday the mayor, um, I guess in his uh, press conference, he talked about uh, the city has already spent $3.8 million um, on this effort, and that he talks about uh, DIFTER's emergency plan, that in the, you are gonna be visiting over 600 senior congregates setting each week uh, to ensure be. implementation Thank uh, you, of congregate setting protocols. Now, Thank you. when you Thank talk you. about 600, are That's you well also beyond. including the social adult daycares too? Absolutely. We are, thank you for, for jarring my memory. I was just, my concern in this conversation was to make sure that we are not escalating and, um, and, and causing greater alarm than what really exists in our senior centers. The mayor has been very, very clear. We have given out incredible number of guidance and information to our whole network of services. The mayor wanted to ensure that those, uh, that information was being implemented. And so what we have is an emergency plan that we have devised, an emergency plan with, that involves both DIFTA staff as well as additional staff to visit seven, uh, 600 congregate sites throughout the city precisely to ensure, number one, that they're posting the information, that the information is being distributed to the consumer population and or to the, to the population that they're responsible for, to make sure that the professionals have the guidance to, to know what to do should any incident occur, and also uh, to inform the staff, the non-medical staff that go into the home to know what those protocols should be and the kind of guidance that, that they should have. So this is a well thought out plan. We will be visiting senior, uh, older adult centers and congregate centers well beyond the Department for the Aging uh, sites. We included NORCs that are not funded by the Department for the Aging. We have included the SAD, SADs that are not funded by the department, so it's gonna be a widespread effort to ensure that everybody is taking the proper precautions and using the guidance that has been distributed to them. Am I still have the floor? Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that we are here in the, in the budget hearing, uh, trying to 
to prioritize the things that we are doing. And the, the I used to be chairman of the aging committee when I was in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And if I were, I'm listening to everyone that spoke, even the chairperson, we are confronting a very, very serious situation with the, with the coronavirus throughout the nation, going to the city, let's talk about the city. Nobody's talking about this. I didn't hear you, Commissioner, putting an emphasis that we are doing this. I didn't hear the chairman doing. So I'm asking, I'm saying, what are we doing to protect the senior citizen population? Are you putting any money? Are you asking specially requests? We have to do this. We have to protect. We have to invest. I'm just asking. And I'm Thank just you, letting. Chair. And I'm just letting you know clearly, sir, that the mayor has been uh, on top of this and communicating with the public almost daily in press conferences. We have tabletop meetings. All of the agencies. Uh, getting guidance from the Department of the Health under the leadership of this mayor. So this information on what we are doing and what we need to do and what we are looking forward to doing should situations arise is something that we are at a heightened preparedness and we have confidence that uh, this city is well prepared to address um, this crisis. Thank you, Councilmember Diaz. Uh, Councilmember Traeger. Uh, thank you to the chairs for holding this important hearing, and thank you, Commissioner, for, for uh, being here uh, this morning. Uh, to your knowledge, uh, with all of the um, added precaution, precautions that the administration, that the mayor's office, is requiring of, of agencies, particularly to your agency, to your knowledge, do any of the added precautions go beyond the scope of the DIFTA contract that are currently in uh, existence with providers to our seniors? Do any of the precautions require the providers to go beyond the contract scope of services? The guidance, I do not believe to my knowledge that any of the guidances issued go beyond the scope of any contractors, uh, any of the provisions in our contract. And I would, if there are any in particular that you would like to raise, and I would love to talk to you offline and so that we can defer those to the Department of Health and come up with some solutions. Well, I mean, for example, I mean, I chair the Education Committee, and right now uh, the DOE is going to have to add added resources to school budgets to deal with uh, deep cleaning and cleaning of our schools custodial budgets, maintenance cleaners in our schools are going to have to have extra resources to work overtime after the school day, before the school day. Uh, do you believe that providers have sufficient resources to conduct thorough cleaning and maintenance of, of senior spaces? It's one of the things under review right now, council member. And uh, the Department for the Aging, along with the Department of Health that monitors our congregate sites, maintenance and sanitary conditions have always been a high priority because we're in the food preparation or the food service business. Uh, but it's one of the things that we're looking at right now is the resources. Do we have adequate resources? And as the mayor said, we're all looking at that to make sure that we are prepared should additional resources be necessary. Have, have providers already reached out to you requesting additional resources and support? Uh, in, in terms of complying with added guidance? Not to my knowledge, sir. Um, I'm just sharing with you best practices from other agencies. In the case of the DOE, schools needed extra help. And I am going to safely assume that providers need extra help as well. Um, this is particularly particularly for our seniors, who are at most risk yes. when it comes to this virus. Right. Um, and so I would just urge uh, both your agency and OMB and the mayor's office to grant every request made to ensure that our providers and our senior spaces 
have every resource that they need to keep our seniors safe and supported. That is our intention also, and so we share that commitment and passion with you, and we are reviewing that on a daily basis. So to date, you have not made any requests to OMB for added resources to, to deal with the coronavirus? Have you made any requests to OMB for, for added resources? We are in, in as, uh, we are on tabletop uh, meetings with the mayor on a regular basis where we're discussing all of the various needs and also uh, trying to forecast what future needs may be. And I appreciate that, but have you made any, any requests so far to OMB? We've made some requests, not to OMB, but to us as a city. Because we wanted to do this widespread canvassing, we did not have the staff resources, so we're getting resource staff resources from across the city to make sure that we can visit each one of, of our facilities. I'm gonna share with you another, another accommodation being made for DOE that I think should apply for DIFTA. The DOE is now gonna to have to contract with additional nurses to make sure all of our schools have access to healthcare professionals. Over 70,000 kids in our school system do not have a healthcare professional with them all day. Is that gonna be the case with DIFTA providers? Will DIFTA administration provide additional help with healthcare professionals to visit and be with providers in, in, in senior spaces to provide direct care? Because my concern is if we do not have a healthcare professional at the front end and proactively working with our vulnerable population, the worst thing that could happen is that, that seniors end up in the emergency room of hospitals, which are very dangerous already because the spread of other very serious disease uh, that could really compromise their health immediately. So I think that it is wise for us to proactively at the front end provide healthcare professionals to senior pro to pr providers to visit them, to make sure that everyone's practicing proper protocols. So are there any plans in place that you're, that you're aware of to provide additional healthcare professionals, nurses, to senior spaces? That is not a request that we have made at this time, but it is, it is one of the issues that I will raise at the next table talk, so I thank you for that. And, and I just encourage you to, we have your back to make sure that OMB and the mayor's office gives you everything you need to keep our seniors safe. Um, and uh, the, the last question, I don't know, forgive me if it was raised already, Chair, the issue uh, uh, of home care meals uh, for, for, for se senior providers. Uh, I, I have one in my district that has a need for kosher meals, and they're being told that because of the restrictions, uh, uh, they will not be able to provide uh, kosher meals in terms of the home, home delivery meals. Is that something that you, ha you're, are you aware of? I, I, I'm totally not aware of that because kosher meal provisions is part of the RFP and it is a commitment that we have to make sure that we have a diversity of meals based okay. on religion and ethnicity. So I will speak to, to folks offline just to follow up on, sure. on that district issue. Thank you. Uh, thank I you, really Chair. really appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Traeger. Um, I was going to, my next question is on, on this RFP and thank you uh, for your suggestion in terms of working with the senior centers on uh, the, the protocol to, um, to our seniors and making sure that we have adequate resources. So when, Commissioner, when you go visit those center, it's not enough that they post up the signs, but I think that they really have to distribute materials, and especially with home deliver meal, that the, the information should go along with the meals and so that everybody has that information on it. So hand. great minds think alike because we have a, like it's, it's a 10 point checklist that people who are visiting are asking and doing and also will bring us back feedback so that if we find any deficiencies, we can address them. Thank you. Um, so on the home deliver meal um, program is, is critical concern to the council. As you recalled, I, uh, reply to DIFTA's concept paper citing concern about inadequate funding. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't receive a reply. Nevertheless, we have reviewed two independent studies showing that DIFTA's meals are underfunded by around $2 each. So after the RFP was released in January, Human Service Council delivered 
its highest risk ever risk rating in an RFP, 75%, uh, citing inadequate funding and a lack of transparency. Yesterday, a fourth addendum uh, to the RFP increased available funds by about $640,000. So how did the department determine the funding rate per meal in its RFP? And why is there no additional funding for culturally responsive kosher or challah meals? And how does DIFTA make requests to OMB when programs like home delivered meals or senior centers need more resources um, in the baseline budget? Because in your testimony, you mentioned the home delivered meal uh, budget um, was only was 41.8 million. So, in, and in addition, was 640,000. Do you think that's efficient to cover? 40. The the, the number I uh, cited is correct. That's right. That's correct. 640. That that was the uh, added in the addendum. But in your testimony, you said that 41.8 million yes. was allocated for home deliver meal budget. Correct, the, the 41.8 is the total budget that we had. I mean, we, when we did the initial RFP, we left out some money and we realized that, um, and we added it back into like. So, uh, so I, wanna, I wanna address a little bit of the cost, the per meal cost. I'm looking for that page. Um, the way we calculate that per meal cost is obviously we look at total meals, uh, we look at uh, food costs, we look at, we assume some savings based on uh, group planning, we look at some savings based on the fact that we are now managing catering costs, so that there'll be catering costs that will be somewhat uniform across the city. Um, we also look at, um, contributions, and so you arrive at a per unit cost. Um, salaries and all of the operate, all of the operating uh, factors. I wanna remind everyone that the average me home delivered meal cost uh, currently was between $8.60 and $8.80. So we went from that, there's some, some contractors are as high as $10.16, but the average is between $8.60 and $8.80, and we increased it to $9.58. Um, the other thing that we did differently this year that we've done in the past is that contributions were not included in that unit cost, that contributions now are added it, so that if a if a contractor collects, a, let's assume, 50 cents a meal, their food costs now are $10.08 rather than $9.58. So we did know that there was a, an increase needed in these meals and we increased it to 9.58 and also then took the additional step to take out the, uh, congreg uh, the contribution portion, that revenue out of the actual meal cost that we gave. I can't find Michael's, do you have Michael's email? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. great. I'm, I'm looking for a particular document. The PMMR confirms that for at least three years, the Home Delivered Meals program have been serving hundreds of thousands of meals above its target. Now this new RP would leave about 310,000 meal gaps between the targeted number of meals served in the catchment area versus the PMMR actuals. So if this RFP say waiting lists are an option, do you support placing seniors or uh, older adults on home deliver meal wait lists? And given the rising cost of food and fuel and other necessity, uh, of a home deliver program, why didn't DIFTA include a cost escalator in the RFP? When we, first of all, there's not a decrease in the number of meals. We are serving 18,000 meals a day now, and the RFP 
allots for 18,000 meals a day. So there is not a decrease in the number of meals. I've heard that statement before and that is incorrect. Um, when we, we, we're looking at, what we attempted to do in this RFP is start looking for home delivered meals now and in the future and trying to look at many, many new bold initiatives, more collaboration across uh, contractors, more group purchasing across uh, contractors so that we can have scale. We looked at state of, we're looking at state of the art food preparation practices. We also were looking for, you know, new initiatives in terms of qu higher quality food um, and, and things of that nature and also looking forward. Um, if, in terms of cost escalators, that is a conversation that we could, you know, part work with the mayor's office of food policy and start looking at food cost escalators for the future. But right now, given current state, uh, this RFP was trying to take some steps to move us forward and into the future, but at the same time, recognizing with the increases in meal costs, the num our main target is ensuring that we can provide 18,000 uh, meals a day. I mean, Commissioner, you said it, that there's not a decrease, but if a provider accepts like a $20,000 shortfall annually to serve everyone, even over target, so that's not right. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding something. Um, there is not a shortfall in, the, there's not a reduction in the number of meals, which is what I heard the statement to be. In the, in your RF, in the RFP, it, right. there is a gap because there are providers that are serving above their target. Oh. Right, so. I, I know, okay, I got it now, I'm sorry. Um, so it just shows that there's, there's an increasing need. And if you in yeah. if you are in your RFP, no, you're only budgeting right. the same number. I'm sorry that I, I wasn't, I didn't understand and I didn't hear it correctly. Um, there is always a growing need and I've said over that the needs outpace uh, the demand, I mean the resources. And what we've done is we've looked at the 18,000 meals that we provide uh, this year um, and use that as a base. So you're, so you're open to like looking at a cost escalator? We're looking at working with the Mayor's Office of Food po Policy and looking at everything as we move forward. We're also looking at, you know, improving our food, following good food purchasing practices so that there's a variety of things that we're looking at um, together you know, from a future perspective. And I also, in our discussion, I remember you were talking about, I think this, this is related to the, the capital budget, when you were talking about commissary kind of um, kitchens where providers can be utilized. We're looking utilize. at efficiency as long as efficiency doesn't undermine diversity and as long as efficiencies do not undermine community base. We're looking at efficiencies and scale and how is it that we can do that within our network in, in, in terms of forming working groups and learning groups among our, our, our providers. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the, the next issue. <laughs> Case management and home care wait list. There is still a wait list. You know, on Wednesday, we learned that there are 1,245 case management clients on the wait list, while there are 478 home care clients awaiting either new or increased service. I'm glad to hear case management programs are currently hiring and onboarding staff to help address the wait waiting list, but the wait list deserves serious attention. Um, it seems like every year we still got to address this. Why has it been so hard to reduce the wait list and does DIFTA believe 
it has sufficient funding to clear them by the start of fiscal year 21. And how long are senior waiting for an in-home case management assessment? And how much funding is needed to clear the wait list? Furthermore, will DIFTA consider an automatic funding escalator aligned to the growing need? Um, we see cost escalator with other programs in the city uh, that I mentioned in my opening remark, such as social service coordination program um, in the SARA finance senior housing. So can we use that to deal with the wait list? We are open to exploring all different options, but I want to be really clear that this wait list is not a, it's a, it's a point in time. It is not a wait list as if you're waiting forever to have services turned on. All of the individuals on that list are at different stages in the assessment process. So it is not as if none of them have received some information or contact. I also want to say from a case management perspective, every, every person gets a, in a phone call assessment to start determining need. We triage those. We do not, you know, you don't become number one and you, you until number two doesn't get served until number one does. We triage it and those with the greatest needs start getting priority, number one. Number two, everyone gets an, a phone assessment so that we can have that ability. The other thing that's really important, if anyone has a meal need, that meal gets turned on immediately. Um, so it is not a wait list in a tra as we traditionally think of wait list. Is it a problem? Is the need growing? Absolutely. Um, but it is not a problem that is not being managed and it is not a problem which means that older adults in need of services are not getting them. And much of our home care hours are that wait list is due because people need additional hours. So it's not as if they do not have services currently. It's just that it's uh, a lot of that is for added hours. But I think what um, the question I had was how long are seniors waiting for an in-home case management assessment? And I know that from my office personal, you know, my office experience helping constituents that it still take a while for them to get that in-home assessment and then finally get the home care service. So these are not people waiting for expanded hour. They're waiting to, to get the service mm -hmm. and it's still, they have to wait a while. It's not like, oh, within a week or two weeks that Every, they can get that service. Everyone gets, um Everyone, everyone gets a phone assessment so that we can be able to triage them. I will get back to you to give you the data on, um, on uh, high needs and uh, um, what, what the wait time is, but I want you to be assured that high need individuals don't wait. Okay, I mean, the main thing is that we just don't want to have the older adults on waiting lists, and this is something that we address every we are, year, it's, it's, and we want to make sure that there's sufficient funding um, to address that. Um, That's a shared concern, thank you. Yeah, so the, the, the other question I have is on this whole senior center RFP that, that you're, you're planning uh, for this year. Now, DIFTA's annual plan state that it intends to issue a concept paper for the RFP for senior center this spring and summer. And this will be one of the most consequential RFP for DIFTA in a decade. So what has DIFTA begun to do to prepare for this process? And will DIFTA do outreach in multiple languages and in each borough as part of the pre-RFP process? And also is DIFTA considering funding any of the following four items as part of the new RFP. First, baselining the existing council initiative. Second, 
expanding geriatric mental health services to every center. Third, co-locating social adult daycares in the centers. And fourth, play, paying providers for extended cooling center opening hours. Well, um, I can tell you that we are looking at several of those issues that you've mentioned. Right now, we are in doing a lot of research on state-of-the-art services, not only here, but across the nation and across the globe. As we have done and has been my commitment, we will have as many stakeholder meetings prior to the concept paper to get people's input. But we're, you're right, this is one of the most crucial RFPs that we will issue because we can't look at this RFP as we look at aging today. This RFP has to prepare us and create a pathway as we look at aging to the future. So as we have tried to, in this first effort with the home delivered meals to start looking forward, we will do the same thing with the uh, congregate sites. In that, we will hold a variety of stakeholder meetings, look at creative aging and all these new concepts that we know just advance and are important to the aging community and to older individuals and how it increases and eliminates social isolation and increases their, uh, their sociability and their ability to, to live, uh, to, to what is it, to age in place. All of those issues are being considered. One of the things that we will do is then, after all of that input, is begin the concept paper, and that sets up another round of inputs and opportunities. So this will not be that DIFTA sits in a room, does some of the great state-of-the-art researching and analysis, and puts out a concept paper. This concept paper will be informed by some of the best thinking that we have in the research field, but also some of the best thinking that we have within our own network and some of their desires and future directions and see what we can implement in that. In terms of uh, paying for providers for cooling centers, um, right now we have some costs built in uh, to our, we will reimburse and we do reimburse uh, contractors for some expenses related to cooling, um, to serving as a cooling center on off hours. And we will look at that uh, very seriously. And, I, and it, it, I'm intrigued and was intrigued by our conversations about expanding services to build in senior adult kind of activities within congregate settings. So it is something that we will look at in terms of this wide array of services that um, we're looking at. And What about the paying providers for extending cooling center open hour? I mean, our senior center right now could be more highly utilized. I mean, it's right, right now, most of them are just Monday to Friday uh, and they close in the evening. There are some center like um, in my district and council member Rivera's district, we share, that do have dinner uh, meals. Uh, so I think one of the things we wanted to really look at is that the mayor uh, in his state of city talk about new community centers. So senior centers could be part of that, the older adult center one could be part of that, and it could be really um, highly utilized weekend. We, we, those you know, are all they, they need some place to, they want to go to the center, but they're, most of them are closed on the weekends. Those so those are, those are all the options. options that we would like to look at. And we also believe, and this has been a conversation I've had with a few of congregate setting directors, which is the, the utilization of our kitchens. Our kitchens are used to just serve one meal, you know, that maybe we can look at capacity within kitchens. So all of those are discussions that we're having and see where our vision takes us and where our resources take us.
Yes, the resources. That's what we got to make sure that we have adequate resources to do that. Um, the other question is on the social adult daycare, right? There, there are many concerns around the growing number of social adult daycare across the city. Uh, in January, DIFTA finally issued rules associated with their oversight uh, of the SAGs under Local Law 9 of 2015, including a civil penalty schedule associated with chronic violators. Um, this SAG ombudsperson's office has four staff and a $300,000 baseline budget. Now first, what action are underway to address um, the social adult daycare center fraud and abuse? Second, will the ombudsperson initiate any complaints or investigation on their own, or is it entirely based on complaint? And has DIFTA spoken to the state official about um, SADC reports of fraud and the potential Medicaid saving that could be realized by prosecuting fraud. And one of the three penalties incurring violation is failure to adhere to program standards. What does that mean and what standards will the ombudsperson use to evaluate whether a SADC is in compliance? So, like you, I am very pleased that we now have rules that have been promulgated. I'm also extremely pre pleased that we've been able to activate the payment portal. To date, we have 18 individuals, so there are revenues that come into the city now, um, one by the registration process, and then the other one is based on the fees that, imposed, that are imposed. We have a team that will go out based on uh, violations or, or complaints. And then we will also have, obviously, what we call secret shopper. Um, and we will look at that. We are, our team and our, and our current leader is in close contact with the, with the state and they refer to them every violation or infraction that we find. And so that, that we might not know the disposition that the state uh, imposes on an SAD, but we do make sure that, because that information doesn't come back to us, that we do make sure that every one of those is, is logged and registered with the state. Um, this is a, a new endeavor for us. We are as concerned as many are uh, about the potential abuse, which is why this administration, with a lot of your coaching and uh, support, have been able to establish this office through Local Law 9, and are now uh, staffing it to the level that we, we are looking forward to seeing the results of this. Yes, I mean, 2015, I mean, that's, that's a long time. Yes, And was. we're waiting for those rules, and so far you said only eight have registered they have to they have 30 days from the day that the rules were promulgated to register so, so what's the, the penalty so the portal, since the portal was open to register what's the penalty for not registering in time there oh that's very good um, there is a schedule so a thousand dollars a day and then it uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, any of you. Uh, it's about a thousand dollars a day, and then and then the penalty continues. That's good. So have they all been notified? The They've over three hundred. They've all been notified, <laughs> and we've been very aggressive in asking them to uh, register, which is the first first line of uh, of our ombudsman program is making sure that each one of them is registered. So in that registration, can you just share with us the information that we'll be able to get from that registration? Sure, we'll get back to you with that. In terms and I of, promise you that we will get back to you in time. <laughs> in terms of participant, because we want to know if we can get like participate, you know, participant, uh, yeah. how much do they charge the government, the participation rates? Um, so that it might we not can be have as, a, it, it might not be as extensive as we would want it to be at the beginning, but I think we get some basic information, and I and I commit to you that you will get that by the end of today. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, just a few more questions on the, on the capital uh, budget and expense uh, funded repair. How does DIFTA work with other agency partners to prioritize which capital projects get prioritized? Uh, will DIFTA sit down with council finance to review the entire DIFTA capital project portfolio with start dates, key milestones, and expected uh, completion date? since when you say most of the funding comes from the council. And can DIFTA share with the council the list of centers and contractor providers who have or are planned to receive expend funded repairs uh, to their premises? Uh, yeah, so regarding the capital budget, like we mentioned earlier, we will sit, we'll happily sit down with the council and identify the various projects that, and what stages they're in. And, and we're looking with the administration we are looking at capital and CBDG monies to see ways that we can augment our capital needs because I think everybody recognizes that uh, we need to upgrade some of our facilities and also ensure that, um, that we can also expand some of them. Okay, so before closing, Commissioner, um, we can expect to see in the executive budget the $10 million for the model budget? You can expect the commitment from this administration, which has been given to us, and I am now sharing with you that by FY21, FY that those $10 million will be in DIFTA's budget. Okay. The next two we got to work together on. Yeah. Um, Millions more, million dollars, couple of million dollars more, millions more for the home deliver meal and money for home care and case management wait lists so that we can eliminate. So those are the ones that we will always, will also be advocating for in the executive budget. And we're always in constant communication with OMB around those kind of issues and we feel that we have a strong partnership and ally. Great, so Commissioner, uh, thank you for being thank here. You. Thank you to all your staff, and we're looking forward to getting more resources this year and in partnership with, with you and your agency. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now we invite uh, the public to testify We have a lot of people sign up, so <laughs> I apologize that we do have to put uh, testimonies on a, a two-minute clock because we don't have the, the chamber for the whole day. We have a time limit because there are other committee uh, that has hearing. So you can always submit the written testimony, but share with us the highlight. Uh, Katie Foley from Self-Help Community Services, Caitlin, Andrews from Live On, New York. Beth Fingles from AARP. Tara Klein, United Neighborhood Houses. Rachel Sherrill from City Meals on Wheels. Okay, please begin. 
Thank you. My name is Katie Foley, and I'm the director of, can you hear me? Did you press the button? Yes. Okay. My name is Katie Foley, and I'm the director of public affairs at Self-Help Community Services. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Chin, for the opportunity to testify today. Self-Help provides a broad set of services to more than 20,000 elderly, frail, and vulnerable New Yorkers, while remaining the largest provider of comprehensive services to Holocaust survivors in North America. We're grateful for the Council's ongoing support for senior programs and for emphasizing the needs of older adults. And we know that with strong community-based programs, we're confident that older New Yorkers will be able to access the care and support they deserve and need to age in their own home and homes and communities. I want to highlight a few of our priorities for this uh, budget season. In a budget year where the Medicaid deficit is front and center, we know it's important to remember programs that serve older adults on a relatively small budget while helping to defer substantial costs to the Medicaid system. I want to emphasize that an investment in Shazam, Self-Help's Active Services for Aging model, would result in savings to the Medicaid program by preventing or lowering costs to the emergency room visits and keeping low-income seniors out of costlier levels of care, such as assisted living or nursing homes. At all 11 self-help affordable housing buildings, we offer service coordination through Shazam, which provides an appropriate level of social services to allow older adults to remain in their homes. We have published a white paper, which is available on our website, that shows the evidence-based research on uh, the exact savings to Medicare and to Medicaid. The Ellie Wiesel Holocaust Survivor Initiative demonstrates the commitment of the city to ensure that some of our city's most vulnerable receive the care and services that they need. This year, we're urging the City Council to renew this initiative with continued support for self-help and our Holocaust Survivor Program. We operate the oldest and largest program serving Holocaust survivors, caring for nearly 4,800 elderly and frail individuals. And this funding supports direct social services to the frail, isolated, and financially needed survivors, as well as a unique educational program that shares survivor stories with the next generation. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today, and we appreciate the City Council for the ongoing support for the Senior Transportation Program in Queens, as well as uh, all the discretionary funding in Schedule C. Thank you, and we have your full testimony for the record. Okay, my name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live on New York. I'm gonna jump right into the meat of our testimony. Um, our main budget priority this year is the Home Delivered Meals Program. We are asking for $16 million in funding along with our partners um, specifically for this program. Our position is that $13 million of this should go to fund weekday meals and $3 million should go towards the weekend meals. Um, currently, providers are losing money on every meal served and it is critical that at this time, while the RFP is going on and providers are forced with the decision of whether or not to continue in the program, that we know that the funding is there to keep the program solvent for years moving forward. Um, a part of this, we also would hope that there are cost escalators included, as has been mentioned today, so that the program can keep pace as costs continue to rise and so that um, the program does not turn into a deficit as it continues. Um, Live on New York did do a study um, in partnership with United Neighborhood Houses um, utilizing a framework developed by Sea Change Capital Partners um, that confirmed the gap of funding for home delivered meals of, is about $2 per meal as had been previously indicated by Mathematica. Um, so we know that this gap and this funding challenge is real and we're hopeful that this year that is addressed. Um, we also appreciate the um, emphasis on the $10 million in model budget money that still needs to be put into the budget. We're pleased to hear that that will be addressed in the executive budget, and we're looking forward to seeing that in black and white. Um, we also are hopeful that all of the one-time funding is restored, and not only that, but that it's baselined. Um, funding that is baselined is able to go towards salaries and be used in the way that it is truly intended, rather than being used for sort of um, ad additive measures, as a one-time fund can often be um, used for. So we're hopeful that those programs for senior centers, for NORCs, case management, et cetera, are baselined. Um, we know that there are waiting lists for case management and home care, so we're hopeful that that is addressed. And it's a point in time, but it's also annually very similar. So we're hopeful that uh, some mechanism is in place to continue addressing this moving forward. You have my full testimony, so I thank you for your support and your time today.
Hello, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Tara Klein. I'm a policy analyst with United Neighborhood Houses. We are a policy and social change organization that represents 43 neighborhood settlement houses in New York. Um, I want to echo a lot of the things that Caitlin just testified on from Live On, particularly around the home delivered meals request for this year of $16 million. We know that there is an urgent funding need for providers currently. With the new RFP coming out that places even more programmatic demands on the program, this really emphasizes the need for additional funds. Um, so we really hope you'll, you'll take a look at that and help us be a partner in supporting that $16 million ask. Um, I want to highlight um, a new ask this year for the naturally occurring retirement communities, our NORCs. Um, thank you, of course, to the council for their support last year and the nursing funding that was really critical to supporting these programs. Um, of course, our, our NORCs um, help defer people away from the Medicaid system in a year when Medicaid cuts are front and center, so we really think these are critical programs. Um, but unfortunately, the staff in the NORCs right now are facing chronically low salaries. Um, we're seeing that these are much lower than other DIFTA contracts, particularly senior centers and case management, where they've had increases in recent years. So these are people who are um, often with the same job title, often working under the same organization, doing similar work, but the pay differential we've seen is about $15,000 per employee at different uh, levels. And so we're asking for $1.7 million in order to ensure that NORC salary parity this year in the budget. Um, just a few quick other um, things to highlight in my testimony. We believe there needs to be a very large increase in geriatric mental health services across the aging network. Um, this year we're looking to increase this through the uh, DOHMH Council Initiative, um, the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative. Um, we are also um, encouraging more funding to support repair needs and infrastructure across the aging network. We wanna see that $10 million in model budget money there and of course supporting all of the council's discretionary funds and the one-year administration um, ads that we need to baseline. So thank you again for your opportunity to testify. Did that. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Beth Finkel. I'm the state director for AARP New York. I, first of all, want to thank uh, Chairperson uh, Chin, who've been such an incredible leader and advocate for older adults, and also the other council members. And thank you, Council Member Ayala, for hanging in there with us. We really appreciate it. And I also want to thank my fellow uh, advocates here who just do a sensational job providing these programs and services. AARP has 750,000 members in New York City, and without these services that they provide, and without them provided at the level of excellence that I love the way. Uh, uh, Council Member Chin, you, you put it that uh, our senior service should be the crown jewel, and I, we could not agree more and be able to hold them up to every place in the country as the city with the best services for older adults. So thank you. Um, we've been doing a lot of uh, research, AARP, to inform us about the challenges facing older population. And we know that it's all about the pocketbook issues. That influences every other piece of quality of life for older adults and adds the greatest amount of stress to residents 50 plus. Uh, these residents account for nearly a third of our populations and their numbers are expected to increase by 30% in the next 20 years. Financial hardships are felt most acutely by our aging African American, Hispanic, and Asian American residents. As a matter of fact, we just did a report on disrupt disparities which highlights how those hardships are particularly felt by those communities and how they really must be addressed. Uh, matter of fact, in gentrifying neighborhoods, the median annual income for older whites is as much as $100,000 higher than for that for African American or Hispanic residents in those same communities. The council has been very generous over the years with its support of older New Yorkers and the services that they rely on, and we're asking you to do it one more time. Oh my God. So I'd like to point out that not-for-profit senior service providers are counting on you too. We're very worried about the home delivered meals and the parity that was brought up on that with nearly 30,000 homes bound and elderly relying on those services and the six so the 16 million is very key uh, and beyond that we'd like to see the investment in more services for supports the Newark issue again we we 
feel very, very strongly about. Uh, and we just want to make sure that all the money is there and baselined, as I know you've set out earlier. So I could go on. It's in my testimony. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to bring the voice of AARP members here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, we're all aging in place, so I'll be very quick because you know what City Meals on Wheels does, and we've worked in this public-private partnership with you for years. Um, it's in my testimony, it's in their testimony. We need the money to fill the gap to ensure that all 18,000 homebound elders receive meals throughout the week, throughout the, the year. Just want to mention, we are, you know, our goal with the Department for the Aging is ensuring that folks are getting food. With this coronavirus, however this is going to play out, we are working to get meals, shelf-stable meals, to our home-delivered meal uh, clients, just in case there's a disruption in service. In addition to preparing senior centers, our warehouse is now trying to uh, put together 100,000 meals to make sure that senior center congregate members who are not our regular clients will have food on hand at home in case senior centers have to close. So I know the department is working very diligently in trying to protect our clients as much as possible and understanding how important nutrition is for them. We don't want to see our clients malnourished and ending up in emergency rooms and then worse because they are already vulnerable and frail and um, could be more susceptible to anything. Thank you. Did I say my name? It's Rachel Sherrow, <laughs> Associate Executive Director. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you um, to all the advocates who are here, but especially for this panel, um, for your work and your advice and working together with us. We still got a long way to go because Tiftus budget is still very, very tiny. It's still less than half a percent of the city's budget. But hey, the population is growing. The older adult population is growing and we have to be very, very visible. And I think in this budget year, I don't wanna keep hearing from the administration that the cuts are coming down from Albany. And I know that all of you are also, you know, fighting in Albany to make sure that we get adequate funding for our senior. So that's the first step but we will continue to make sure that the older population is taken care of and deserve the funding resources because we all help build this city and it's a blessing to get there and older adults, seniors, part of the future, right? We're gonna be around, so we're gonna have to continue to work hard on this. So I look forward to seeing all of you during this budget process and hopefully we'll get some good news in the executive budget. Thank you again for being here. The next panel. Helen Ha from the Korean Community Services. Howard Chi from uh, Asian American Federation. Hallie Yi from the Coalition for Asian American Children and Family. Karen Zhao from uh, Homecrest Community Services, and Mohammed Raz Razvi from COPA, Council of People's Organization. Even better, because I. I could try it out. I'll, I'll go. I'll go first. Make sure there's a go in it. Can you grab my backpack? Thanks. Okay, is Mohammed here? Mohammed Barasi? Uh, he had to leave. Oh, he, okay. He submitted but, submitted but he testimony. submitted testimony. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, you may begin. Okay. Um, um, thank you, Chair, um, Chair Chin, as well as uh, Councilmember Ayala for uh, holding this uh, test, uh, the, providing us with the opportunity to testify about uh, on, in front of the Committee of the Aging. My name is Howard Shi. I'm the Research and Policy Director at the Asian American Federation. 
Um, as part of our work, we are a census information center, so we do a lot of tracking of the demographic growth of both the, of the Asian senior population. And uh, the last time I think I testified in 2016, we saw that the Asian population has doubled, had doubled, the Asian senior population had doubled since 2000. Um, the most recent data from 2018 shows that the population has nearly tripled at this point. So two years makes a big difference. We fully expect that the Asian population will continue to grow as Asians are aging, in, aging into the demographic um, because of the immigration reforms in the 1960s, increased immigration to the United States. Um, uh, I think a lot of the challenges have been described before. Limited English proficiency is really high among Asian communities, in particular in the Chinese and Korean communities. It's 90% of the population has limited English proficiency. Even in um, uh, the Filipino community, 39% of Tagalog speakers identify themselves as LEP. So even immigrant groups that have a reputation for having high levels of English proficiency still have challenges among their senior population. So just to um, jump, there's, we've submitted written testimony, but to highlight some of our recommendations, I think that the program, the, the Senior Centers for Immigrant Populations Initiative from the City Council has been really valuable in building capacity among our senior serving populations. I think a lot of them here are able to get those funding and we're encouraging the council to up that initiative to at least $2 million. Um, we want to make sure that DIFTA has the funding to, to um, fully implement the, the city uh, language access laws that were passed a couple of years ago, Local Law 30. We want to make sure that we address the growing mental health needs of the community, and we also appreciate C Council Member Ayala especially for providing mental health support as we develop those programs out there. So that, I'll conclude there. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Chair Chin and members of the Committee on Aging for giving us the opportunity to testify today. My name is Hallie Yee, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. And I'll skip down a little since uh, Chair Chin is familiar with CACF and Howard kind of went over a few of my points also. Um, but uh, seniors in the Asian American communities in New York City have some of the highest limited English proficiency rates. More than two in three APA seniors are LEP. Many of our seniors have no social security income because language and accessibility is a barrier to applying. Our seniors are often left out of the conversation in poverty, yet in our city, 23% of APA sen seniors live in it. Many APA seniors have limited access to the social safety net despite their growing poverty rates. Social isolation, inadequate community outreach, and limited English proficiency play a large role in keeping Asian American seniors from accessing social services, which is exactly why our community organization services are vitally needed. Yet in the last fiscal year, only two APA orgs received funding under the Support Our Seniors initiative, which is not an equitable distribution of resources to meet our community's needs. Our recommendations for the budget um, in, would be to enhance the uh, Support Our Senior Citywide initiative and grant additional funding to APA-led and serving community-based organizations to provide those vital services to our aging population, as well as to restore that $2 million to Senior Centers for Immigrant Populations to provide operational support to culturally competent and linguistically accessible non-DIFTA senior centers. Um, and I would like to thank you for this opportunity to testify, I'm trying to keep it short. So <laughs> we look forward to working with the city council to ensure that all aging New Yorkers have access to the services and support that they need to lead healthy, safe, and fulfilling lives. Thank you. We have your full testimony. That'll be on the record. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for your time and um, for this opportunity. My name is Helen Ahn, and I am from KCS. Today I'm here to speak about our ethnic homebound meal like last year. Actually, uh, past one year, I participated in all the meeting, focus group meeting, and home delivered meal preliminary RFP meeting everywhere, but I didn't see any much change for home delivered meal subcontractors, but today, I will talk about overall homebound meal providers aspects. The ethnic homebound meal program is an important lifeline of nutrition of homebound immigrant seniors. Healthy meals are a vital component in improving mental and physical health among older adults. Homebound Asian American immigrants are particularly isolated due to the lack of caregivers 
existing language barriers, cultural differences, and lack of social content. Although we try to fulfill the needs of this community, our unique home delivered meal struggles to continue our services because of serious financial gap caused by the rising cost of meals. These costs which need to cover increased hourly wages, special rough costs, high maintenance of a special hotshot vehicle, high insurance cost of the program, and very low reimbursement rate. The financial discrepancy and deficits generated by the low reimbursement rate and low funding jeopardizes unique ethnic home delivered meal like us and discourage all homebound meal providers. Under the current system in place since 2009 and the new RFP, new DIFTA RFP, the existing home delivered will continue struggling to provide this essential nutrition because of the far below national average, which is like $11.06, cost of meal reimbursement rate of DIFTA, which is $9.58. I will just shorten one thing that one anecdote, from the beginning of the February, I got a call from one of the contractor. They currently our weekend meal was reduced to 50%. They cut down 50% of weekend home delivered meal clients. And also for next new fiscal year, they called and talked to me that if we agree and accept a $6.70 for the new home delivered meal, then they can work with us. So the current DIFTA's RFP rate doesn't reflect anything, and I am wondering if this current rate and the new RFP rate can guarantee home delivered meal providers like us to continue our services. You can read the whole page, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I mean, that's one of the issues that we are gonna be advocating on, that definitely there needs to be an increase. And the issues with subcontractors. Um, the commissioner and I, we've been talking about that and I think that she's really looking into how to really help um, organization uh, to really have the capacity um, to bid for contracts. So we, we look forward to working with you on that. Okay, thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I want to thank the New York City Council and the Chair of Aging, Councilwoman Margaret Chen, for this opportunity to testify today at today's preliminary budget hearing. My name is Karen Zhou, and I'm a, I am the Executive Director at HomeQuest Community Services. We are a multi-social service agency with more than two decades of serving the Asian American immigrant community in Brooklyn. We currently operate two community senior centers in Sheepshed Bay and Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. One of our goals for the centers is to help older adults reduce social isolation and mental and, and increase mental well-being. We have a lot of seniors that are Asian uh, seniors without families widowers who have lost their partners after many years of marriage, and those who are living alone or abandoned by their families. And they really need support. Um, I just wanna share a story about why the Senior Center is vital. Um, earlier last year, we had a senior, Mr. Law. He lost his beloved wife, she passed away, and he was very devastated by the sudden loss. He used to come to the center daily with his wife to play mahjong, and participate in many of the activities. And suddenly he was all by himself. So f we had a pre-Thanksgiving uh, party and we had um, people donated turkeys which we raffled at the center. And to Mr. Law's surprise, he actually won a turkey for the first time. So he couldn't believe it and he was so very happy. A few days later, he came to the center with that turkey. <laughs> He had marinated the turkey Chinese style using Chinese hoisin sauce, salt and sugar, and he asked for permission if we can cook the turkey at the center to share with all the other seniors. He said the turkey is 
too much for him to eat by himself. It, his wife is gone, his kids live far away, they don't plan to come visit him. Suddenly he was alone, um, and he thought about the center at, at HomeQuest. So he has a lot of good friends and many happy memories, and this was a second home for him. So we honored his request, we cooked the turkey, carved it, served it to all the seniors, and it was another sp special surprise for all of us because we didn't expect that. Um, we all had, everyone was very joyous, um, and we know that whether Mr. Law wins the turkey next year or not, at least he has the support. This is why the senior centers are so vital. HCS is in particular need because even though we have two senior centers, it is not funded in the same way. We're very thankful to have been the first Brooklyn Asian American-led organization to get funding through the New York City Department for the Aging for our Bensonhurst Neighborhood Senior Center. But our Sheepshed Bay Senior Center is not DIFTA funded, and it has yet to receive the same level of funding that is needed. So we have been relying on the Senior Center for Immigrant Population Initiative to keep our doors open. We're thankful for the City Council for restoring this initiative in the prior year's fiscal budget. Additionally, I'd like to recommend an investment in funding more Asian-serving nonprofits who can provide culturally competent health and mental health services for seniors. By funding more Asian-serving providers, we can help support families who desperately need places to send their loved ones for help. For Asian Americans, suicide was the 10th leading cause of death. The limited places and resources that are currently available is discouraging, and we should find more solutions to fund more culturally competent service providers, like HomeQuest Community Services, that have the language and the cultural competency to serve this population. Do you have a, a copy of your testimony? Yes, for our yes. Okay, so please wrap up. I like to end by saying that as the Asian American community continues to grow, we anticipate an increasing need for resources. We are at a time when over a million plus baby boomers are retiring nationwide. We hope that the city budget will be inclusive of funding to support senior services. Leaving seniors funding, such as the Senior Center for Immigration Population Initiative, Healthy Aging Initiative, and Support Our Seniors Initiative out of the budget would be unconscionable and would create more wait lists for services and put older immigrant adults at risk. So I urge today all our city council members to consider restoring these initiatives to support the seniors in, in the city budget. Thank you very much. Please make sure that you reach out to your council members <laughs> so that when we're doing budget negotiation that they are supporting us um, to fight for those initiatives. And ultimately, we need to get those baseline by the administration. So make sure your council member uh, hear from you and your constituents yeah. um, so that they can actively support. I mean, in the budget negotiation team, right, council member Ayala? We tell them, uh, if we, need the, their, we need them to back us up. Yes. Because we're in there and they need to hear from their constituents. So thank you uh, to all of you for being here today. And thank you for all your great work, and we look forward to continue um, working with you to advocate for more resources for our seniors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Chen, for your strong leadership. We thank appreciate you. it. Uh, the next panel, Rhoda Soberman from uh, Visiting Nurse Service uh, from Sunnyside Community Services. Siobhan. 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 <laughs> Naboa, okay. Danielle uh, Christensen from God's Love We Deliver, Wesley Davis from New York Roadrunners, and Nancy Jenkins from New York Roadrunners.
Please begin. Hello. Good morning, Chair Chin and members of the Committee on Aging. My name is Rhonda Soberman. I'm manager of program of development for the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about Newark funding. As you know, VNSMY touches the lives of more than 44,000 people each day who face health challenges requiring either short-term intervention, ongoing chronic care services, or end-of-life care. Today, I'm asking the New York City Council to continue the $1.3 million in funding that was allocated last year for Newark Nursing, thanks in large part to you, Chair Chin, and the Department for the Aging and the Council Finance staff. As a result of the city's funding, Visiting Nurse has been able to provide nursing support to 27 NORC programs throughout the five boroughs. By the end of fiscal year 2020, we will have provided more than 12,612 hours of nursing services in support of seniors at these programs. We're also a frontline NORC provider in the NNORC in Chinatown, servicing more than 800 low-income, non-English speaking residents in tenement housing. Newark Nursing focuses on client assessment, health education, health resources, health advocacy, and linkage to necessary health care services. We work as part of an interdisciplinary team, helping staff and clients alike better understand health-related issues and concern and their impact on the client's ability to remain at home. The nurses focus on empowering residents to manage their chronic health conditions and respond to those who need connections to care, and our efforts are aimed at reducing unnecessary emergency room visits and avoidable hospitalization while increasing positive health outcomes and res resident satisfaction. As you know, the coronavirus uh, is, uh, continues to have a lot of concerns for people who live in these communities, and we and our social service partners have worked with the New York City Department of Health and the Center for Disease Control to dispel myths, educate residents on practical ways to stay healthy, and address their health concern. And in addition, we do all kinds of interesting things that help people to, around their health. I've submitted it in my testimony. I'll be just very brief. Uh, we know that there are gaps uh, that, in, that, that our partners, our social service partners, are worried about what's going to happen if we don't get this money for nursing services in 2021. There'll be tremendous gaps in care for all these people. And we also want to help them and support them in securing uh, salary parity for the social workers who work in those NORC programs as well. And in conclusion, we just want to be sure that uh, the, all these NORCs are able to return their nurses, retain their nurses and the social service to, that provide critical care to the seniors. And we urge you to renew the $1.3 in funding for NORC services and help us to strengthen and promote the services. In the testimony, you heard how important uh, embedding nurses in communities are to, at, along with social service partners, and this is a model that works. We've been doing this for many, many years, and we know it works, and it can really help the city as we go forward with our aging communities and you know, growth. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Siobhan Naboa and I'm the Division Director for Senior Services at Sunnyside Community Services. Thank you Chairwoman Margaret Chin for your leadership and for the Aging Committee. At Sunnyside Community Services, we envision a diverse, inclusive, and caring community where all people thrive to their fullest potential and it's with your partnership that we're able to fulfill that vision. In our testimony, we'll highlight some priorities that you can see later on, but I just want to share, I was pleased to hear about the $10 million that will be addressed for the model budget. We have 250 seniors that visit us on a daily basis, and they're critically needing, uh, needs that need to be addressed for their daily needs. One of the other areas of priority is infrastructure. Staff in our senior center have been working off of computers that haven't been purchased for years. Our senior center members spend an average of five hours in our center on a daily basis, and they do so on tables and chairs that haven't been purchased since 2003. We are in dire need of upgrades. Current resources don't cover a recent estimate of $42,286 to replace those tables and chairs. We're also doing our part to ensure every senior is counted in the census, but that also comes at a cost of $2,000 to offer cybersecurity um, for our computers to keep their information confidential and safe. Lastly, I want to say that I can't think of a better time to offer testimony advocating on behalf of critical investments to the human services sector than during National Social Work Month. 
For perspective, at Sunnyside in fiscal year 19, our staff provided 43,000 nutritious meals cooked at our center. We delivered 2,700 hours of case assistance, and we helped screen 1,100 individuals for services and benefits that will help them remain healthy in their home. I close by saying that we support a 3% COLA increase to reinvest in those that are working day to day to help support our older adults. You know, we all hold a powerful secret that most don't know. When those aging around us are able to do so with respect, dignity, and compassion that everyone deserves, they can continue to lead meaningful lives and vibrant individuals contributing back to their communities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Danielle Christensen, and I am here on behalf of God's Love We Deliver, uh, the only not-for-profit provider of medically, medically tailored home-delivered meals and nutrition counseling for people living with life-threatening illnesses. God's Love began 34 years ago, providing services to the most underserved and isolated populations in our city, those who are sick and unable to take care of their most basic need, the need for food and nutrition. At God's Love, nutrition is our signature difference. Although some older adults can tolerate regular food, aging and illness can lead to a variety of complications that require a specialized diet. God's Love clients receive services from our seven registered dietitian nutritionists who tailor each meal to meet each client's specific medical needs. All our meals are well ba balanced, low in sodium, free of highly allergenic foods such as nuts, nuts and shellfish, and immune supporting. Our menu allow for individualization of meals according to dietary needs, include texture restrictions such, such as minced and pureed diets and renal diets. Each year, God's Love continues to grow to meet the demand. Last year alone, we delivered nearly 2 million meals to over 8,200 men, women, and children living with severe illnesses throughout the New York City metropolitan area, including 5,181 New York City older adults who received over 1.2 million meals from God's Love. As New York City's population ages, senior New Yorkers are increasingly relying on God's Love We Deliver for meals to meet their spe specific medical needs. There's a service gap in the current DIFTA model for providing home-delivered meals for se severely ill seniors who need customized nutrition. Of the 1.1 million older adults living in New York City, 93% report not having enough food to eat and 32% indicate that they live alone. In addition, people are also getting sicker. 28% report having diabetes, 12% indicate that they're living with COPD, and 65% report having high blood pressure. These factors, combined with the increasing amount of ADL limit limitations that occur as a person ages, demonstrates a current and increasing need for medically tailored food and nutrition. Despite receiving referrals from the Department for the Aging, we have no direct contractual relationship with DIFTA and are not reimbursed for the meals we provide to those that they refer to us. Furthermore, despite our advocacy efforts, DIFTA did not include medically tailored meals in its 2020 RFP. God's Love is currently serving New Yorkers living in every zip code throughout the five boroughs, and we have enclosed a table reflecting our services for older adults by New York City zip code, which reflects a existing and growing need for medically tailored meals. Accordingly, we respectfully ask the Department for the Aging to include funding for medically tailored citywide um, or issue a separate RFP specifically for medically tailored meals for older adults living with life-altering illnesses. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Chen. My name is Wesley Davis, and I serve as the Assistant Manager of the NYR Shires Program at New York Roadrunners. Thank you for your, this opportunity to testify before the Committee on Aging on the FY 2021 preliminary budget. New York Roadrunners' mission is to help ins and inspire people through running. We achieve our mission by creating running and fitness opportunities and programming for people of all ages and all abilities. While New York Roadrunners is best known for producing the TCS New York City Marathon and our free school-based programs, our organization is also dedicated, a dedicated provider of free community programming for parks in all five boroughs of New York City. In 2019, our weekly senior walking program, NYR Shriders, operated in 38 unique senior and community centers throughout the city, and our free other free programming and resources like our Walking 101 workshops coordinated in partnerships with New York City's Department for the Aging combined to touch the lives of over 2,500 older adults and seniors throughout New York City. Maintaining and increasing access to free health and fitness services is an imperative for the well-being of our city's seniors and the people who call them friends, parents, grandparents, and loved ones. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services recognizes physical activity as a critical for both 
preventing and treating many chronic conditions that affect people of all ages and abilities. There is an abundance of evidence that, act, that active older adults are less likely to suffer from falls and that walking is an easy way to help seniors enjoy better quality of life and live independently for longer. Additionally, walking programs and walkable communities are good for social connectedness, good for business, and good for the environment. NYR respectfully asks the New York City Council to consider a request of $100,000 to support our free health services to over 2,500 seniors in all five boroughs due to Health Aging Initiative during the 2021 fiscal year. Thank you for your time. Good day, all. I'm, my name is Nancy Jenkins. I'm a participant in the Roadrunner Stratus program. This program is phenomenal, especially for older people like myself. As walking has done for me, I used to be on two heart, um, high blood pressure pills. Since taking it, I'm only on one, thank God. Um, it has helped me mentally because on the loss of a loved one, I had people to walk with and walking and talking really helps you well, with your depression and outreach. And telling the, the ladies and gentlemen that I was walking with well, what I was going through, they said, listen, you are not alone. And that is very important when you're older because you do feel alone being that you're getting older and you're losing loved ones. This program also inspired my children by them seeing me walking and doing things. I had a granddaughter do a 5K on the same day I did a 5K in the Percy Sutton Walk. I also had another granddaughter do a 10K with my daughter, and her daughters are now doing track and gymnastics. So this program is very, very important to my family, I know, and the ones that I walk with. And it also inspired me to say, it makes me say that I don't wanna be a burden to my children, and I do not wanna be in a nursing home. So this program is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am glad you are fit and strong. So let's get this program to senior centers all across the city. Walking is great. Uh, and I wanted to thank all the advocates and for your great work and, and your advocacy. We're going to be working very hard on this budget. Um, I know that the home deliver meal program did not include medical meals, and we have expressed that to DIFTA and it's such a critical program. And so I think that um, we still got a long way to go to fight for the resources that older adults deserve. So thank you all for your all great work again and thank you for being here today. Okay, so this is the last panel. One more small panel. Oh, one more small panel. Anyone else that wanna testify, please make sure you sign up uh, with the sergeant. Uh, Carmen Perez. Uh, Cooper Square Committee, Nork, Melissa Scar from uh, Sage, uh, Joel O'Neill from uh, New York Junior Tennis and Learning, and Lu Lucy Saxon from New Yorkers for Culturals and Arts. Please begin. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairman. Uh, my name is Jim O'Neill. I am the Director of Government Relations and External Affairs for the New York Junior Tennis and Learning. I am here today in support of the Council's Healthy Aging Initiative, an initiative designed to do a number of things, including promote healthy behavior such as physical activity. As you know, NYJTL is the most successful and largest scholastic tennis program in the country, and you have supported our programs, uh, Madam Chairman, for so many years, which we greatly appreciate. Next year will be our 50th anniversary in New York City, and we're in every single district of New York City serving over 85,000 uh, youngsters. 
More recently, however, we have begun to expand our outreach and programming to seniors in the Bronx. During this winter, we have offered free our pro, free three-hour programs that promote tennis, health, and wellness at our flagship facility in the Bronx, the Cary Leeds Center for Tennis and Education. This $12 million facility is a public-private uh, product of the city, and during the day where we have underutilized courts, we've been providing free programs where we bus seniors into this beautiful facility. This is a, a magnificent facility that's won all sorts of awards. They come and have a wonderful, a light breakfast. They get on the tennis court. Uh, we have health coaches there, and we're promoting tennis as a lifestyle for fitness. We have some of the best coaches here. Tennis is a sport that promotes health, it's a preventive measure, uh, it, it's fighting heart disease, et cetera. We've got great research that indicates that it promotes tremendous health. So we're asking the council to renew funding for their initiative, the Healthy Aging Initiative, and with those dollars, NYJTL would provide an outreach primarily to the Bronx where we would expand this program and bring in more seniors. We greatly appreciate your support for these programs. Good afternoon, my name is Melissa Sklars. I am the SAGE Senior Government Relations Strategist. Thank you, Chairperson Chin, and your intrepid committee council. Uh, SAGE is the, the country's first and largest, oldest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT elders. Uh, right now, uh, we have five SAGE centers across New York City providing comprehensive social services programs to more than 5,000 LGBT elders. Um, LGBT elders are a significant part of our growing older population, often invisible, disconnected from services, and severely isolated. Uh, they're half as likely to be partnered, twice as likely to live alone, and more than four times less likely to have kids. And because of these thin networks, LGBT older people provide more on service providers, and yet in Many of these providers, there's still discrimination from staff and from their fellow um, older people, and so there's discrimination with healthcare, social services, other programs, and so elder people turn, elder LGBT turn to SAGE. This year, we've, last year we opened our first LGBT-friendly uh, senior affordable housing in Brooklyn, in Fort Greene this year. We're hoping to do the same in the Bronx. We will be opening large, extensive SAGE centers in each. The one in Brooklyn will have 8,500 square feet. The one in the Bronx will be over 10,000 square feet. These will be the largest SAGE centers in the city. Uh, they will have daily healthy meals, case management, support service, life-enhancing medical and legal references, uh, workshops. And not only will they be open to the residents, but they will also be open to all the elders within uh, the neighborhood. I'm here today to ask for restoration of $1.2 million on uh, council initiative funding to support our service LGBT centers in the Bronx, Harlem, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. I'm here to request a restoration of $150,000 to support our citywide network of SAGE centers for pro program and enhancement initiative. And finally, I'm asking for a restoration of $100,000 to provide support and care management to our diverse SAGE elders constituency in all five of our SAGE centers. Hi. My name is Carmen Perez, and I'm director of the uh, <clears throat> Cooper Square Committee Neighborhood NORC program. And I'm certainly happy to be here to testify in support of NORCs and neighborhood NORCs throughout the city. And I'd also like to thank the city council for supporting the NORC program. Um, because of the council's enthusiasm for this program, we have been able to bring resources and attention to the needs of a rapidly large and growing elder population. Um, our North program, thanks to the generosity of the city council um, and, of course, the Department for the Aging, has allowed us to provide the following services of uh, health, uh, legal, benefits planning, case management, home visits, and social and recreational events. Um, we serve approximately uh, 500 unduplicated seniors per year. Um, however, we um, are certainly talking about the budget in terms of um, parity with our um, sister organizations and senior centers. It's just not quite the same. 
Um, in a budget year where Medicaid deficit is front and center, it is important to remember that North programs serve residents on a relatively small budget while helping defer more substantial costs to the Medicaid system. Um, so by keeping us around, <laughs> we keep seniors healthy as well as save a little on, on, uh, on dollars for hospitalization and of course, um, nursing home care. So investing in NORCs can definitely uh, help limit these increased costs to the Medicaid system. Uh, and also the nursing component in the NORC program is extremely important. Um, we pro nurses would provide services that otherwise just wouldn't exist in, in their own communities, such as medication education, diabetes testing, flu shots, mobility and balance screenings. Um, unfortunately, the city's NORCs have been struggling with chronic low uh, staff salaries as uh, contracts have not allowed for meaningful rises in many years. Um, So what we're asking for is an additional million dollars for the NORC program and another um, 1.3 million for nursing. So finally, we ask that the council work with the administration to ensure salary parity for the NORCs, um, as well as competitive salary for nursing. Um, older New York City, uh, older adults in New York City rely on these services to remain healthy, stably housed, and without these services, their options for receiving um, appropriate community-based care would be greatly diminished. And it maintains uh, viability while preserving the integrity of the community. Uh, so in closing, we at Cooper Square um, are in agreement with our general North communities and um, hope that we can definitely have the funding in place so that our programs can run efficiently and sufficiently for, help, for a healthy perspective for our seniors. And again, thank you for your time and your continued support. Good morning, Chair Chen and City Council members. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Lucy Sexton. I'm the head of the cultural advocacy group, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, a coalition working to ensure that every New Yorker has the right and opportunity to engage in culture, express their humanity, and strengthen their community. I'm also a Sukasa teaching artist, which is one of the joys and honors of my life. Two years ago, I worked at the CPC Open Door Center in Chinatown. Today, I'm working at Project Fine Clinton on West 55th Street. The people in my classes get to dance, tell stories from their lives, create and perform their own theater pieces. In response to a question, when in your life have you felt the most loved, a Cantonese-speaking gentleman cried as he said that he'd been working in factories since he was 14 and doing these classes with this group of people at Open Door Center was the most loving and happiest time of his life. I recently asked the group of women I'm working with to tell me a story from their childhood. Astoundingly, each woman's story involved waking up early to travel to get water for their family. I had no idea they were not born here, and most importantly, they didn't know that they shared these stories uh, in their past. I tell these stories not just because they're powerful and moving, but because they are the meat on the bones of the irrefutable data. When seniors are involved in the arts, they live longer, happier lives. Culture is a critical piece of elder care, a proven supporter of physical and mental health. Speaking of health, it is often the gardening, painting, and dance, and music classes that get seniors coming to the centers. And it's in the centers that they get access to healthcare information, that they're seen by others who can direct them to care if they're getting sick. I don't need to remind us how important this is during this frightening time, and of that's of particular danger to seniors. And particularly those who are in economically vulnerable communities depend on even more on the connection that culture and art classes in our senior center provides. So I encourage you to fight for access to culture and arts for every senior in our city. By supporting culture, you're supporting better education, better aging, improved mental health, stronger communities, and a city that respects the dignity and humanity of all of its citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your testimony. And we really appreciate you know, the work that you do to support our seniors. The cultural program, we were at a, an event when we you know, seen all the seniors singing and dancing. And I did talk um, right. to people about the story about uh, the senior at Open That gentleman, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, it's just really moving that they have the opportunity to really open up. And um, Sage and Cooper Square, <laughs> you guys, we're going to have a senior housing in my district that is also LGBT friendly. Hopefully we'll get that done soon. 
Um, and thank you all for being here and for your great work that you're doing. And in the next couple of months, gotta continue to do that advocacy to make sure that in the executive budget, we have some good news and we gotta continue to make sure is that we get the resources to support our older adults. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Chin. Chairwoman. <laughs> oh, our last panel. Dr. Cynthia <laughs> Morton from the Visiting Neighbors, uh, Sandra, Sandra Christian from Riseboro Community Partnership. Oh, just give it to the sergeant, they'll take care of it. Uh, Heidi uh, Sikafri from Center for Independence of the Disabled, Sydney. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? I think that's it. Anyone else that wants to testify? Okay, thank you. Hi, you, be, you can begin, thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Heidi Siegfried. I'm the Director of Health Policy at Center for Independence of the Disabled in New York, Sydney. And I'm here to request city funding for the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, which was created pursuant to the Older Americans Act. The mission of um, the New York State Long-Term Care Ombuds Program, LITCOP, is to serve as an advocate and resource for older adults and people with disabilities who reside in long-term care facilities such as nursing homes, assisted living, and board and care homes. LITCOP is also charged with identifying systemic issues and addressing them through advocacy so that the state may address these issues and prevent related problems in the future. The state program is one of the biggest in the country, but it lacks commensurate funding. 61% of other states have a higher paid staff to resident ratio than New York. The state has more long-term care residents than almost any state in the country, yet is 45th out of 50 in terms of percentage of state funding for ombudsman services. The number of paid staff is only 50% of the recommended minimum number established by the Institute of Medicine. An alarming number of residents do not receive routine visits and programs and are simply unable, we are simply unable to maintain a regular presence in all long-term care facilities. So the, just to explain the program a little bit, um, we have five borough managers, but then it's really a sort of a volunteer-based program and, and we recruit volunteers who take 36 hours of training and become certified to, and they are assigned to a, have a regular presence in, in the nursing homes. Um, so New York City Lit Cop is a lifeline for more than 55,000 residents residing in the 244 long-term care facilities throughout the five boroughs. 134 nursing homes and over 30,000 residents do not receive routine visits due to the inadequate resources dedicated by the state to the program. New York City has one staff position for every 8,800 beds, less than 25% of the recommended level. Instead of five paid ombudsmen in the field, we should have, if we were fully staffed, according to the Institute of Medicine recommendations, have over 25 paid staff. So that's why we're coming to the city to um, urge that you help us to remedy the dangerous level of underfunding for long-term care ombudsman program by adding a um, million dollars in resources, and this would enable us to add the staff to ensure that residents receive more frequent visits. And we, especially now, what's happening with the coronavirus, um, we've received a list of nursing facilities that have really bad grades on infection control, so we're really trying to focus on, on that in particular. Um, and, and, and they, we also uncover a lot of problems with improper discharges, it's sometimes dischargers to shelter. Some of our ombuds people, they actually represent people in fair hearings um, to, to stop on improper discharges to shelter. Um, we also see uh, psychotropic drugging that's improper. Um, so we identify these things and report them to the Department of Health so that, you know, so that they can be investigated 
better. Um, so that's a really important program, and we have seen that other localities do provide funding to the program, so, and I understand that Suffolk County is a locality in New York that does, so that's why we're looking to see if, um, if the city might dedicate some funding to the program. So I got to go over because they didn't put the timer on. <laughs> That's okay, since you guys are the last panel. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Sandra Christian. Um, I'm the Vice President of Seniors at Riseboro Cooney Partnership. Um, I don't have testimony because I wasn't sure if I could get out of my Meals on Wheels program this morning to get here. So um, I want to thank the Council Member Chin for your advocacy for model budgets, for case management, Social Adult Day. It's very appreciated. Uh, additionally, we look forward to building in partnership your senior housing in your community. Um, we run a s about 1,600 meals per day in our Meals on Wheels program. We're one of the few programs that chose when RFPs were last issued to cook most of those meals ourselves, and we partner with three other community-based agencies to provide culturally sensitive meals. This budget that has been, the, the, we believe in all the aspects of the RFP. We think it's a great way to be offering choice and where we should be going. But in all the focus groups that we had, we expressed that you couldn't do these things without funding. So if I'm looking at my budget minimally, just the minimal cost to provide the, the choice options and enhance the food, it would cost 54 cents uh, per meal in addition to the 958. There's also other costs that aren't covered. Um, we lost last year, well this year we're projecting about a $200,000 loss, which for a nonprofit um, that's struggling to support senior services is difficult. Last year it was more. Um, thanks to Live On and group purchasing, we think that we've brought down some of that cost. Um, group purchasing is great. It doesn't always meet the local um, purchasing, food purchasing goals of this RFP. Uh, in fact, we've tried to do some of that and local farms could not provide produce for a Meals on Wheels program to meet our numbers. Senior centers, yes, but not in Meals on Wheels. Additionally, the model budgets that went in, the most recent one that went into kitchen staff, went to senior center kitchen staff, which is wonderful. Meals on Wheels kitchen staff did not get that model budget funding, so we have to increase to meet those salaries which causes further deficit. So we really appreciate the advocacy and we believe that at minimal the uh, one-time cost need to be baselined for the RFP. And that's on Meals on Wheels, that's it. I just wanna make one comment about Social Adult Day. Um, the DIFTA discretionary Social Adult Day programs are critical, they are underfunded, and the services they provide are to seniors who really need Social Adult Day in comparison to the pop-up senior center programs. And when you're talking about cuts and cuts on the Medicaid level on the state, how have we increased those costs by having seniors who could go to our senior centers going to these social adult day programs that get reimbursed at a much higher rate? So thank you for your time. Last but not least, <laughs> um, with a big impact. First of all, I wanna say thank you for the opportunity. I Forgive me, my throat is still a little off, um, but I wanna make a point about that. Last week I had no voice, and I tried to do things over the phone, and twice was hung up on because the automated systems was like, uh, we didn't hear your response. And then um, when I actually went into a pharmacy and I had no voice trying to reach somebody to talk to who was like literally standing right near me, they basically were oblivious and I'm flapping. So imagine a senior who can't necessarily have a voice or their voice is weaker. Plus I found that people talk over you when your voice is a lot less. So we wanna first of all thank the council on behalf of all of the clients and the impacts that we have. At least a thousand people in the course of a year and many more who have been affected by the support of your, of your funding for us. You are our hero, Margaret Chin, and the, and the council is our champion. 
and we need you to continue to be so. We know we're preaching to a choir, but we need that choir to sing. We need your voice strong so we can have a strong voice for those who can't. We work with people 60 and up to 105 as our eldest right now. We have a strong, growing uh, centenarian population, and we want to be there for them. We take walks, get them out, socialize, because they should be part of our community just as anyone else. We all want to be treated with dignity and respect. We all want to be able to be safe crossing the street. And today with people on cell phones not paying attention half the time when they're walking, people have been knocked down. Bikes too, big issue there. So safely helping people get out, safely people having people connect with others, safely having them have information that they can communicate with their doctors. A lot of our seniors are don't have necessarily good conversations with their doctors are afraid to ask the white coat syndrome they are the expert uh, how, why should I ask and we make them make it clear you need to communicate with your doctors ask questions we're also a pair of eyes and ears when a senior goes into a hospital make sure somebody knows that somebody else is watching it makes a big difference basically we're here to keep our older adults independent safe at home in the community engaged connected mentally stimulated we couldn't do that without your funding through the initiatives, through the discretionary funds, it all makes a difference. It all keeps us being a lifeline for those people who absolutely would have nowhere to go. And they're not going to senior centers because vast majority of our clients can't get out. Quick statistic, 75% of our clients are over 80, 33% are over 90, 98% cannot afford to pay for any of these services. And so there you have it. And 90% of our clients are living alone. And it's hard to imagine a city like ours where anyone could feel alone, but when you've, you know, don't know who to trust and you don't know how to make those connections and friendships, that's what we're here for, to help make those connections and keep people out of the hospital and keep them informed and let them know their rights. And that's what we want to thank you for. And we need you to continue to be our champion and sing for us so that our seniors can go anywhere and have a voice behind them. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you all. Uh, Cynthia, do your, the seniors that you work with, yes. do they, do some of them get uh, Meals on Wheels or the home care services? Some of them get Meals on Wheels. Some of them get home care services. Most fall through the cracks and they are, have just enough um, to get through day to day, but not enough to be Medicaid eligible. And at the no, this is not the Medicaid. The oh, you're talking about just in general the, the ISA program. Yes, yeah, some of them participate. Them. Some yeah. of them, to be honest, don't love the meals, but you also have to be motivated to eat them. That's the other piece. And if you're depressed, you can put something in front of somebody. It doesn't necessarily make them going to eat it. But yes, yeah, some of them do participate. We work with with many other agencies and to be able to coordinate program, including getting around the city, which isn't always easy either. So I mean, your program is definitely wonderful, and I don't. We've been advocating with DIFT of why this should be a regularly city funded program Thank and you. not just on you know volunteer it's services. also caregivers and yeah. if we're all lucky we're going to become one an elderly person and i mean elderly for me it has a different definition it's 85 on plus uh so it's not the the younger set but the young they were now calling the oldest old super seniors because you make it to 100 you're a super senior um but the youngsters the junior seniors the the 50 to the six, uh, 59, that, that ARP beginning set. We need some advice on information too about what to prepare because one thing we hear over and over again from our 80 year olds, I didn't expect I'd have to relearn. I didn't expect that, that I things wouldn't come you know, just easily for me. I had this idea of what retirement was and we're not prepared as a society. Plus it's a huge age category. It goes from a huge span. You can't just put it all in one category. Things happen in different points in time and also luck and circumstance and how much of a support system we have. We are our friends to our seniors. That's what um, we were described as a, a group that came in to do an analysis of how would you describe what visiting neighbors. We're the best friend. And our council so far has been our best friend so thank you and thank you margaret thank you all i mean thank you to all of you for the the great work as i said to all the panels advocacy continue um 
and we, with City New York, let's, let's talk about how the city can provide some support, especially when the nursing home facilities and in our city, we want to make sure that the seniors there are also getting support and, and, and are protected. Just to let you know, the, uh, Scott Stringer, the controller, has also been looking at this issue, and he's supposed to be <laughs> releasing a report soon, but he, he is also supporting the idea there should be additional funding, so we're hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> also, one other thing, we have stories, stories after stories. If that helps and you need stories to back up what you need to do, we can express it. Great. And those stories are what makes us unique. Each individual counts. Each individual counts. We Not appreciate that. We definitely would um, work with you on that because uh, I think you heard from the commissioner earlier. It's the whole ageism, and we have to really fight against that. that because is, yep, everybody's going to get there. You're blessed. If you're <laughs> you know, lucky. To be an older adult. And to be healthy. And to be in your own home. Yes. Great. Thank you again all for being here today. Uh, the preliminary budget hearing for fiscal year 2021 for the Department uh, for the Aging Committee is... Adjourned.